The 2000s was a hugely transformational time for the WWE. Yes, from the decade starting off in the heights of the Attitude Era, then moving forward into the Ruthless Aggression Era and beyond, it's a time that will never be forgotten. But how did it all happen? Well, join us today as we take a deep dive into the entire decade year by year in the WWE in the 2000s, a decade in review. The year 2000 was a huge year in pop culture. In television, Malcolm in the Middle first hit the airwaves. In film, Scary Movie was selling out theaters. And over in the world of wrestling, the WWF would be going through arguably its best year ever creatively. Yes, this was the year where stage two of the Attitude Era took over as, with the loss of Steve Austin and the introduction of a host of new great wrestlers, things would go to another level entirely. So join us today as we take a deep dive into the entire story from start to finish in the WWF in 2000, a year in review. When we last left off, Triple H and Stephanie McMahon had taken over the show as the heel unit of the McMahon-Helmsley regime and the big show was the WWF Champion. That last point, though, would soon change when on the January 3rd episode of Raw, Triple H and his reformed DX lackeys would work together to help him get the title off the big man, with this allowing him to start his third reign on top. Meanwhile, around the time this was happening, the first of 38 hardcore title changes for the year would take place when Test won the belt. All well back in the main event, the McMahon-Helmsley regime were aiming their ire directly at Mick Foley. And though this was originally supposed to lead to Mankind vs. Triple H at the first big show of the year, January 23rd's Royal Rumble, in the end, Mrs. Foley's baby boy would feel the need to morph into a far more sadistic incarnation so as to get the job done. That was why, when the time for the show came, it would be Cactus Jack who took on the game instead, with the match they put on ending up being arguably the best of the entire Attitude Era. And while for Foley, it gave him a chance to have one last hurrah in front of Madison Square Garden, for the incoming champion and eventual winner, it would allow him to finally reach that next level with fans, cementing him as a true main eventer in the process. But of course, that wasn't all that was happening that night, as well on the undercard, Taz would make his debut when he choked out Kurt Angle in just 3 minutes and 16 seconds, the Hardy Boys and the Dudley Boys would have a classic tables match, and Chris Jericho would become the undisputed Intercontinental Champion after beating China and Hardcore Holly in a triple threat match, the main event would be all about The Rock. Yes, this was the night where, with Steve Austin temporarily gone, the Great One would rise to the top when, in the Rumble match itself, he outlasted 29 other competitors to win the whole thing. Well, kind of. As in actuality, a botched ending would see his feet hit the floor before the Big Shows did at the close of the bout, leading to the Giant uh, technically being the victor. So, using this as part of the storyline going forward then, Paul White would demand a shot at The Rock at the next pay-per-view of the year, No Way Out, on February 27th, with the stipulation being that if he could pick up the win here, then he would go on to the main event of WrestleMania instead. Before we would get there though, Kurt Angle would score his first gold with the company when he became European Champion, Harvey Whippleman would briefly become the Women's Champion, Lita would make her debut when she helped S.A. Rios to become the light heavyweight champion, and four of WCW's top prospects, Chris Benoit, Eddie Guerrero, Dean Malenko, and Perry Saturn, would collectively jump ship as the Radicals, with them immediately setting about establishing themselves as top guys by going after the McMahon-Helmsley regime. Of course, this was far from the only problem Triple H had at the time though as, while that was going on, he was also having to deal with his upcoming rematch with Cactus Jack, one which would be held inside Hell in a Cell. So in an attempt to even the playing field, the game would demand that, this time, if Foley could not get the better of him, he would have to retire forever. And that led to the match between them at No Way Out then where, after a brawl that lasted for 24 minutes and saw the challenger take another big bump through the cell, the champion would score the pinfall, apparently ending the career of his heated rival once and for all. Elsewhere on the show, meanwhile, Kurt Angle would defeat Chris Jericho to become the Intercontinental Champion, the Dudley Boys would capture Tag Team Gold from the New Age Outlaws, and The Big Show, with a little help from Shane McMahon, would score a screwy victory over The Rock, stealing his WrestleMania main event away from him in the process. This then would lead to a series of segments in the weeks that followed which saw the Great One find an unlikely ally in Vince McMahon, someone who had by now returned to the company to take back power and felt that the best way to do this was to add The Rock to the main event of WrestleMania so as to get the belt off Triple H. 
But that wouldn't be the end of the story as the last McMahon, Linda, would also show up around this time too to announce that, rather than it being the triple threat match at the showcase of the Immortals, there would be a fourth competitor, someone who had never gotten the chance to get his WrestleMania main event before, Mick Foley. And this would lead to the big show on April 2nd where, with a McMahon in every corner, all four competitors would battle it out to see who would become the champion. Before that night would come though, Mae Young and Mark Henry's unlikely romance would end with her giving birth to a hand, Stephanie McMahon would bolster her stable's power when she became the women's champion, and another notable woman of the era, Trish Stratus, would make her debut as the valet of Test and Albert. And when WrestleMania came around on April 2nd then, she'd be in her team's corner as they took on Al Snow and Steve Blackman. Meanwhile, the rest of the undercard was being made up of a hardcore battle royal which saw Crash Holly's memorable 24-7 reign temporarily come to an end, Kane finally putting his long-standing feud with X-Pac to bed, Edge and Christian, the Dudley Boys, and the Hardy Boys changing the game for tag team wrestling with their triangle ladder match, and incoming Eurocontinental champion Kurt Angle losing both of his titles during a triple threat match with Chris Benoit and Chris Jericho. Then, in the main event, it would ultimately come down to two when, after the big show and Mick Foley had been eliminated, The Rock and Triple H would battle it out over the title. And while most expected this to be the Great One's coronation as top guy, fans would ultimately be thrown a swerve when, instead, Vince McMahon would turn heel on the challenger, screwing him out of the victory as the game became the first heel to win in the main event of WrestleMania. Not that this would be the end of the story though, as at the next pay-per-view of the year, Backlash on April 30th, just a few days after Chris Jericho had torn the roof off the place during Raw with a phantom WWF title win, the People's Champion would get his rematch, this time with the promise that none other than Stone Cold Steve Austin would be returning to stand in his corner. Before that happened though, Eddie Guerrero would charm China with his Latino heat, causing her to turn on her now former ally Y2J and cost him his European Championship during a match between him and Guerrero. And that would lead to Backlash where, while Eddie was successfully defending his newly won belt against S.A. Rios and his stablemate Dean Malenko was doing the same with the light heavyweight title in a hugely underrated match against Scotty Tuhati, the main event would see The Rock and Triple H finally go at it one on one. And this time, with the help of Stone Cold, who came out towards the end of the match to an absolutely earth-shattering pop and laid out the McMahon-Helmsley regime with a steel chair, the People's Champion would finally get the big win, as from there, he would start his fourth reign as WWF Champion. So taking his duties seriously then, he'd head over to the UK on May 6th for Insurrection, there successfully defending against both The Game and Shane McMahon. And to make matters even better, this time he'd be able to do it without the help of the rattlesnake as, still technically recovering from neck surgery, Austin would disappear again for the next several months. Come the next US pay-per-view of the year though, Judgment Day on May 21st, it would be back to one-on-one -on -one competition, as there, with WWF on-screen commissioner Shawn Michaels acting as the special guest referee, The Rock and Triple H would attempt to settle things once and for all in an hour-long Iron Man match. Before that happened though, the undercard would see Shane McMahon defeat the Big Show in a last man standing match, Chris Benoit get the better of Chris Jericho in a submission match for the Intercontinental title, and Kurt Angle's comedy team with Edge and Christian go up against everyone's favorite dancing trio of Rikishi and Too Cool. Then in the main event, the two top guys in the company would exhaust each other for a full hour, with it all eventually coming down to the wire as the score ended up being 5-5 with just a couple of minutes left. And that was when, after having been missing in action for the prior six months, The Undertaker would finally make his return to the company, albeit this time in a far different look. Yes, this was the debut of the American Badass, as shedding the dead man gimmick he'd carried for years up until then, Mark Calloway would ride down to the ring on a motorcycle so as to lay waste to the McMahon-Helmsley regime. Unfortunately for The Rock though, this would lead to Triple H getting a last second disqualification victory and as a result, the overall win in the match. But even if he was now the champion once again, the game would have little time to celebrate, as from there, he'd be forced to prepare for three challengers at the next big show of the year, June 25th's King of the Ring. And that was because on this show, the main event would be a six-man tag that saw the champion partner up with Vince and Shane McMahon to take on The Rock, The Undertaker, and Kane, with the stipulation here being that if any of the babyfaces pinned any of the heels, then they'd be the new champ. 
and of course, come the end of that match, it would be the People's Champion who stood tall once more after pinning Vince McMahon. But that wasn't the only noteworthy event coming out of the show as, before this, Kurt Angle and then Intercontinental Champion Rikishi would make it to the finals of the King of the Ring, with their subsequent battle going for just over 5 minutes and seeing the Olympic hero come out on top. Sadly for him though, his celebrations would be short-lived as, the very next night on Raw, a new foil would be introduced to both him and every other heel on the roster when Mick Foley replaced Shawn Michaels as the on-screen commissioner of the company. And aside from screwing with Kurt Angle, this would also see Mrs. Foley's baby boy set out to end the reign of terror the McMahon Helmsley regime had instigated in the months preceding, with his first order of business being to name a new, more deserving number one contender for The Rock's WWF title in Chris Benoit. So at the next big pay-per-view of the year then, fully loaded on July 23rd, The Rock would battle it out with the rabid Wolverine, with the champion eventually picking up the win come the end. As far as the rest of the card, well, that would be made up of a number of notable matches, one of which saw Chris Jericho take on Triple H in a last man standing match. As well as that, Kurt Angle would take his next step towards the main event when he faced off against The Undertaker, all while the newly formed Acolyte Protection Agency were destroying Edge and Christian to win the tag team titles. Then, in further title action, Val Venus would defeat Rikishi in a steel cage match for the Intercontinental title, with this coming not long after Trish Stratus and Lita had found themselves on opposite ends of the ring for the first time when they took part in a mixed tag match with their partners TNA and the Hardy Boys, respectively. And following that night, both women would even get to briefly become part of the main event scene when, while Lita was defeating Stephanie McMahon to win the Women's Championship on Raw's first ever women's main event, Trish would be forced to team up with Triple H during a tag team match on the red brand, something which led the billion dollar princess to begin suspecting the newcomer was having an affair with her husband. But this wouldn't be the end of the romance drama between the power couple as, while that was going on, Kurt Angle would develop a crush of his own on Stephanie, with this leading to the two of them repeatedly teasing something happening between them over the weeks that followed. Of course, unhappy with what the Olympic hero seemingly had planned for his wife then, the game would start feuding with him soon after that. And all this would eventually lead to August 27th SummerSlam where, in a triple threat match for the WWF title, both men would find themselves going up against The Rock. Before that happened though, the undercard would see the remains of DX finally fizzle out when X-Pac defeated Road Dogg, Taz's fall from grace be further solidified when he lost to Jerry Lawler in just over 4 minutes, and the newly formed right to censor score a win over Rikishi and Too Cool. On top of this, the stacked card would also feature China winning the Intercontinental title during a mixed tag team match, pitting her and her partner Eddie Guerrero against Val Venus and Trish Stratus, Steve Blackman sends Shane McMahon plummeting from the top of the scaffolding at the entranceway in an impressive stunt, and Chris Benoit get the better of Chris Jericho in a 2 out of 3 falls match for the Intercontinental title. But that wasn't all because after this, Kane and The Undertaker would go to a no contest, all while elsewhere, Edge and Christian, The Hardy Boys, and The Dudley Boys were blowing fans away again with the first ever Tables, Ladders, and Chairs match. Then once all this was done, the main event would see The Rock retain after Kurt Angle suffered a nasty concussion early on in the bout, with this causing the champion to splinter off into a four-way feud with The Undertaker, Kane, and Chris Benoit from there, as Triple H and the Olympic Hero set about settling their beef one-on-one. -on -one. And as it happened, this showdown would come at September 24th's Unforgiven, where after just over 17 minutes, the game would score the win. Elsewhere, meanwhile, as The Rock was retaining his WWF title once again in the main event Fatal 4-Way match, the Hardy Boys were continuing their string of bangers with Edge and Christian when they defeated them in a steel cage match to win the tag team titles, and Eddie Guerrero was successfully defending his Intercontinental title against Rikishi, the very same title he'd only recently won from China in a slimy fashion. And while this would end up leading to them splitting up soon thereafter, as far as Unforgiven was concerned, the most noteworthy part of this show was still to come, as backstage, Stone Cold Steve Austin would soon arrive to continue his investigation into who had run him over the year prior, with this being something he'd only recently started doing upon his return to TV in the weeks leading up. But even if he didn't get the answers he was looking for on that night, they would come soon after, when on the October 9th episode of Raw, it was revealed that Rikishi had been behind the hit and run, with him at that point claiming he just wanted his cousin to have a chance of reaching the top instead, or as he put it, I did it for The Rock. 
And of course, the fact that Rikishi wasn't even on the roster when Austin was run over didn't help to sell the whole thing. No, in fact, fans pretty quickly rejected the reveal as being a disappointing payoff to the entire angle. So, hoping to move past it quickly then, the Rattlesnake would absolutely brutalize Rikishi during their showdown on October 22nd's No Mercy, beating him to such a pulp that the match was eventually thrown out as a no contest. Aside from that, the rest of the show on this night would see Lita and Trish Stratus once again find themselves on opposite ends of the ring during a mixed tag match with TNA and the Hardy Boys, Bubba Ray and Devon Dudley host their own Dudley Boys Invitational Tables match, and Kurt Angle challenged The Rock for the WWF title in the main event. And what made this one more interesting was that, despite having been beaten by Triple H the month prior, the Olympic hero had managed to convince Stephanie McMahon to be his manager, a duty she carried out to perfection, as after just over 21 minutes, Kurt would pin the Great One to become world champion after less than a year on the roster. Yes, it had been quite a rise to the top, but it wouldn't end there as now holding the top prize, the new champ would have to defend it against all comers, the first of which would be The Undertaker. And that match would come at November 19th Survivor Series where, fully being baptized by fire, Kurt was put through the ringer against the American Badass, only to somehow come out the end of things, leaving with his title still around his waist. Meanwhile, as this was going on, the rest of the card would see Ivory and Lita battle it out over the women's title, the Rock try to beat some sense into his cousin Rikishi, and Steve Austin take on Triple H, with this one coming about after the game had revealed it had been him who hired the big man to take out Austin a year prior in the hopes that he would get him out of the main event picture for good. So unleashing all his fury on his opponent that night then, the Rattlesnake would absolutely batter him all around the arena, eventually leading him to the parking lot where, after Triple H tried to escape in a car, Austin would raise it up on a forklift and drop it 30 feet to the ground. Yes, it was clear by now that the main event scene was becoming filled with so much chaos that something would have to be done about it, and that was why, after one more stop over in the UK for the December 2nd Rebellion show, Mick Foley would announce that at the final pay-per-view of the year, Armageddon on December 10th, the top six contenders would all face off against each other for the WWF title inside Hell in a Cell. And this, of course, would mean that having to defend his belt against Steve Austin, The Rock, Triple H, The Undertaker, and Rikishi, Kurt Angle was not happy about the situation. But then, he wasn't the only one left unhappy as it happened because, feeling like the commissioner was endangering a number of his biggest stars by putting them all in such a match together, Vince McMahon did everything he could to try and stop it going ahead in the weeks that followed. Before fans could find out if he'd been successful in this, though, the undercard of Armageddon would see China fight Val Venus after the rights to censor had taken umbrage with her Playboy cover shoot, Chris Jericho defeat Kane in a last man standing match, and Chris Benoit become Intercontinental Champion again after beating Billy Gunn. Then in the main event, with the boss being unable to get the match cancelled, things would quickly devolve into chaos as, while all six competitors brawled inside the cell, he would come out with a wrecking crew, fully intent on dismantling the whole thing before it could go any further. And despite Mick Foley coming out to eject the boss after he'd gotten the door off, by then the damage was done, as now with a pathway to the outside of the cage, the action would quickly spill out onto its roof where, in a far safer bump than Mankind had taken two years ago, Rikishi would be chokeslammed off the side. Meanwhile, back in the ring, the brawling would eventually leave every man so beaten up that, at a certain point, Kurt Angle was able to steal the pin on a prone rock, allowing him to, from there, brag that he'd been able to beat every top contender at once. As for us though, that's where we'll leave it for today, because this would mark the end of 2000, a year that, to this day, is still considered by many to be the creative peak of WWF. Yes, it truly felt at this point like the boom period would never end, as with the company overflowing with star power both old and new, and WCW and ECW seemingly on the verge of death, there appeared to be no stopping the train. That was until 2001 came around, and things would hit a bit of a snag, but we'll get there another day. The year 2001 was a huge year in pop culture. In film, we would see the debuts of both the Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter franchises. While this was happening, Apple would release the first iPod. Meanwhile, in the world of wrestling, the Attitude Era was continuing to roll on. And with both ECW and WCW closing their doors for good, the WWF would finally win the Monday Night Wars and move on into the infamous Invasion Angle. But how did it all happen? 
Well, join us today as we take a deep dive into the entire story from start to finish in the WWF in 2001, A Year in Review. When we last left off, Kurt Angle was the WWF champion. Both Steve Austin and The Rock were vying to see who the real face of the company was, and elsewhere in the wrestling world, World Championship Wrestling and Extreme Championship Wrestling were undergoing their death throes. As far as Vince McMahon's promotion was concerned, however, there was no danger of them going out of business, because rolling into their first pay-per-view of the year, the Royal Rumble, on January 21st, it would be full steam ahead. And the undercard here would see two titles change hands when Chris Jericho defeated Chris Benoit for the Intercontinental Strap in an excellent ladder match, all while the Dudley boys were beating Edge and Christian for the tag belts. But it wasn't all title changes as, after this, Ivory would retain her women's title against China when the ninth wonder of the world suffered a kayfabe neck injury, all before Kurt Angle managed to get the better of Triple H when Steve Austin interfered to screw his continued rival out of the victory. Of course, that was all place setting for the main event though, as in the Rumble match itself, arguably the greatest Rumble of all time, things would be dominated by Kane during the early going with him mowing through a number of opponents here, including, but not limited to, comedian Drew Carey. That said, as things went on and the likes of The Rock, The Undertaker, and Rikishi got involved, it would get much more heated, with each of these feeling like they could be legitimate contenders to win. In the end, however, when it was all said and done, it would be Stone Cold who would come out on top for a record third time after last eliminating Kane, booking his spot in the main event at WrestleMania as a result. But his opponent for the big show was still up in the air at this point because, while Kurt Angle still held the gold, there was another pay-per-view to go before the showcase of the Immortals came, and as such, another challenger he would be forced to contend against. And unfortunately for him, his challenger at February 25th's No Way Out would turn out to be none other than The Rock. Of course, that wouldn't be the only big match going on at this show though, because before that, Stephanie McMahon would enact some revenge over her father's latest mistress, Trish Stratus, carrying on the McMahon Civil War storyline, a storyline which had by now seen Vince repeatedly goad his kayfabe comatose wife Linda with his affairs. Then after that, Triple H and Steve Austin would settle their beef in a three stages of hell match, with the first fall a singles match being won by the Rattlesnake, all while the second one, a street fight, was won by the game. So with it coming down to a steel cage bout then, both men would destroy what was left of each other, with it eventually ending with the heel knocking out Austin with a sledgehammer, then collapsing on top of him to pick up the pinfall. But winner or not, Stone Cold still had his WrestleMania World title match to look forward to, and his opponent for that would ultimately be decided when, in the main event, The Rock would end Kurt Angle's four-month reign as champ to take the belt home for himself. So just like that, it was set up for April 1st, arguably the two biggest stars in the industry's history going one-on-one -on -one to see who the real top dog was. But this was far from the only reason WrestleMania 17 would be considered by many to be the greatest pay-per-view of all time, because aside from having the perfect main event, the undercard would be absolutely stacked too. Yes, this is generally regarded as the end point of the Attitude Era, and if it had to stop there, then what a way to go out, because pretty much everyone and everything that made the period so special was represented here, all coalescing together to create a truly magic night. And as for how it got started, well, early on we would see four titles change hands when Chris Jericho defeated William Regal for the Intercontinental title, Kane won the hardcore title in a triple threat match, Eddie Guerrero pinned Test for the European belt, and China finally got her revenge on Ivory when she took the women's strap from her. But that wasn't even the half of what made this show great, as after that, Kurt Angle and Chris Benoit would have a Matt Classic, the Hardy Boys, Dudley Boys, and Edge and Christian would raise their game even higher with TLC2, a fun gimmick battle royal would see some names from the past return, and The Undertaker would continue his streak after beating Triple H in an excellent encounter. Then the McMahon family drama would continue when, defending his mother's honor, Shane would take on and ultimately beat his father Vince, all with a little help from Linda and Trish Stratus that was, the latter of whom turned face during the match after having had enough of the boss's misogynistic ways. But this match was about more than just the McMahons, of course, because just six days prior to the show on Raw, it had been announced that Vince McMahon had purchased WCW, formally ending the Monday Night Wars in the process. 
That said, in kayfabe, during the now famous simulcast segment between Raw and Nitro, it would be Shane who came out to the ring at the Southern Wrestling Promotions show to announce that he was in fact the new owner of WCW, and that going forward, he would be reviving the brand to take on WWF once more. So with this continuing to simmer in the background even after the match was done, it would be left to the main event to close the show, a main event which would decide who was going to be not only the face of the company, but also the WWF champion going forward. And after just over 28 minutes then, it would be the Rattlesnake who would ultimately come out on top. Although in order to do this, he would shock fans when, with the help of a steel chair, he'd turn heel and align with the evil boss McMahon himself. Yes, the sight of the two once bitter rivals shaking hands was something no one wanted to see, and as a result of this, with their hero now taken from them, many simply stopped watching in the weeks and months that followed. And it also didn't help things that the next night on Raw, The Rock would be written off of TV for a while too so as to go film The Scorpion King, with this leaving the company with no top babyface. But what about Triple H we hear you say? Surely he could have turned and feuded with the Rattlesnake? Well, no, because instead he would actually align himself with Austin, forming the two-man power trip in the process. And this would lead to April 29th's Backlash where, rather than seeing the newly heel Austin defending his title in a singles match, fans would instead watch as he teamed up with Triple H to take on the Brothers of Destruction, with the heels beating them here to become the tag team champions too. Elsewhere meanwhile, the most notable things to come out of the undercard on this show would be Chris Jericho and William Regal's fun Duchess of Queensberry match, Kurt Angle and Chris Benoit's epic ultimate submission bout, and Shane McMahon's last man standing contest against the Big Show. Aside from this though, it was clear that, with ECW having by now gone out of business too, and there truly being no more competition left for WWF, their foot had been taken off the gas and some momentum had been lost as a result. That said, it wasn't like no one was interested in the product anymore because when they went over to the UK for Insurrection just a few days later on May 5th, the company would draw a healthy crowd, one only too happy to see The Undertaker defeat the two-man power trip in a handicap match. And that wouldn't be the end of the heel champion's woes either because when they returned to America thereafter, it would soon be time for May 20th's Judgment Day, where now it would be Austin and The Undertaker one-on-one -on -one for the title. But that wasn't all that was happening on this night as, prior to the main event, Kurt Angle and Chris Benoit would settle their beef in a 2 out of 3 falls match, China would defend her women's title against Lita in what turned out to be her last match with the company, and Kane would pin Triple H to win the Intercontinental title the game had recently procured from Chris Jericho some weeks earlier. Still, even if the two-man power trip had lost the secondary belt, at least in the main event, Austin would be able to defeat the dead man, allowing them to keep the world title under grasp. And on top of that, they also still held the tag team titles, the very titles they would defend against Chris Jericho and Chris Benoit the next night on Raw in one of the best matches in that show's history. Of course, while the babyfaces would be crowned the new champions by the end of that one, what most people remember it for now is it being the match where Triple H tore his quad, with this forcing him out of action for the rest of the year. And the injuries wouldn't end there, because just a month later, at June 24th's King of the Ring, Steve Austin would be temporarily put on the shelf too, when during his successful main event title defense, Booker T would get involved and slam the rattlesnake through the announce table at ringside. Yes, this was one of the early moments of the invasion, something which had formally begun a few weeks prior to this on the May 28th episode of Raw, when Lance Storm interfered in a Steve Blackman and Perry Saturn match. And he wasn't the only one who showed up prior to King of the Ring because on the June 18th episode of Raw, Diamond Dallas Page would also make his presence felt when he was revealed to be the stalker of The Undertaker's wife, Sarah. But they wouldn't face off quite yet because at King of the Ring, it would be Shane McMahon himself who flew the flag of WCW when he had an absolutely brutal street fight against Kurt Angle. All this before the Olympic hero would then go on to the King of the Ring final, where he ultimately lost to Edge. And now as the new King of the Ring going forward then, Edge would find himself fully representing Team WWF, as in the weeks that followed, the invasion finally kicked into high gear. How would this happen? Well, by WCW attempting to take over Raw and turn it into Nitro, something which fans were introduced to the concept of when Booker T and Buff Bagwell main evented the July 2nd episode of The Red Brand. 
Unfortunately, though, after years of being conditioned to see the Southern Wrestling promotion as lesser, WWF fans would reject this bout, leading to Vince McMahon deciding to scrap the whole concept and instead have WCW just be an invading outsider force. But even if this did seem like a home run concept, it quickly became clear to fans that Booker T and Diamond Dallas Page aside, none of the big stars from the rival company were coming in. And the reason for this was that, with guaranteed Time Warner contracts, which the boss wasn't willing to buy out after all the money he'd spent on the XFL, we wouldn't be seeing the likes of the NWO, Bill Goldberg, Sting, Ric Flair, or Eric Bischoff show up to champion the Invaders anytime soon. No, instead, we'd get mostly mid-carters like Chuck Palumbo, Billy Kidman, or Sean Stasiak, with this leaving fans everywhere feeling uh, underwhelmed. So, realizing they needed to do something to breathe new life into the whole angle then, WWF would bring ECW into the fold, having Rob Van Dam and Tommy Dreamer join the Dudley Boys, Rhino, Taz, Raven, Lance Storm, Just Incredible, and Mike Awesome in reviving the hardcore promotion on the July 9th episode of Raw. And as if that wasn't enough, later that same night, ECW would join forces with WCW to create the Alliance, with Stephanie McMahon being introduced as the new extreme boss going forward from there. Yes, by now, audiences were starting to realize that the whole thing was turning into yet another McMahon family drama angle. But even that still didn't stop them watching in their droves during the Invasion pay-per-view on July 22nd where, with the war now formally hitting the ring, the show would do record buys. And what were those fans who bought the pay-per-view treated to that night? Well, a pretty good show as it happened. Because with all of the WWF, one notable exception aside, now turning babyface, a series of interpromotional matches would see Billy Kidman defeat X-Pac, Rob Van Dam get the better of Jeff Hardy, and Trish Stratus and Lita score a victory over Stacey Keebler and Terry Wilson. Then after that, the main event inaugural brawl would feature a 10-man tag of Team Alliance vs. Team WWF, with Booker T, DDP, Rhino, and the Dudley Boys coming together on one side, all while on the other side, Chris Jericho, Kane, The Undertaker, Kurt Angle stood alongside the old Stone Cold Steve Austin. Yes, after spending weeks attempting to rally his top guy to return to his old badass ways once more, Vince McMahon and fans would finally get their wish when, on the Raw prior to this show, the Rattlesnake would pretty much single-handedly lay waste to the invading force, seemingly confirming his return to the side of the good guys. Of course, that would be short-lived though, as by the end of the inaugural brawl, Austin would have turned heel once more and joined the Alliance, leaving fans disappointed all over again. And what made this one even worse was that it made no sense for Stone Cold to want to return to the company that had once fired him, with it all just further exposing how weak the Alliance side of the roster was if they needed someone like Austin to prop them up. So it was lucky then that, soon after this, The Rock would make his return to WWF, aligning himself with his home team from there as he became the captain of the New York side in lieu of Austin's defection. And at the very least, this would breathe some excitement into the Invasion storyline, as at the next pay-per-view of the year, SummerSlam on August 19th, the Great One would find himself scoring a win for Team WWF when, in the main event, he pinned Booker T to become the WCW World Champion. Of course, with Steve Austin successfully defending his WWF world title against Kurt Angle on that same night, it would mean that each side now held the other's most prized possession going forward. But that wasn't the only big news of the night, of course, because in the undercard, more titles would move around. When Edge defeated Lance Storm to bring the Intercontinental title back home, Rob Van Dam bested Jeff Hardy in a ladder match to win the hardcore title, and the cruiserweight and light heavyweight belts would be unified when X-Pac, the lone heel of Team WWF by this point, beat Tajiri. That said, despite this show turning out to be a success, the Invasion storyline would be thrown into perspective when, just a few weeks later, the New York attacks would send the world into turmoil. So changing course and deciding to give the American fans a moment they could get behind then, Vince McMahon would book Kurt Angle to get his rematch with Steve Austin at September 23rd's Unforgiven, with the Olympic hero finally being able to get the better of his rival here so as to become the WWF champion. But that wasn't the only title change that happened on this night because prior to the main event, Rhino would become the WCW United States Heavyweight Champion when he beat Tajiri, and Christian, who had only recently turned on Edge and joined the Alliance, would get the better of his now former tag team partner, taking the Intercontinental title away from him in the process. Yes, the title changes were coming thick and fast now, and given how many of them there were at this point, it could be hard to keep up with who held what at times. 
Hell, on the October 8th episode of Raw, Steve Austin would even win the WWF title back from Kurt Angle, ending his temporary feel-good run and returning the company to their original plans after that slight detour. One thing that was not so hard to keep up with, though, was the fact that, while the Alliance was generally struggling to seem like a threat at the best of times, one name amongst the roster was managing to rise out of the ranks as the next big star in waiting, and that was Rob Van Dam. This was why, at October 22nd's No Mercy, RVD would find himself in the WWF world title picture, there taking on Stone Cold and Kurt Angle in a triple threat match. And while he didn't win this one, it would help to elevate him to the next level, making him one of the few bright spots of the whole Invasion storyline. But he wasn't the only one rising to the next level on this show as, in the match prior, Chris Jericho would shock the wrestling world when, as part of his inner WWF feud with The Rock, he'd take the great one on for the WCW world title, eventually pinning him after just over 23 minutes to take the belt home for himself. That's right, there were some good things to come out of the invasion, and had it kept going at this point, maybe something could have ultimately been salvaged out of the whole affair. Sadly though, feeling that the whole thing had largely been a flop, Vince McMahon decided it was time to pull the plug on the whole thing, and that was why, after one more stop over the UK for Rebellion on November 3rd, WWE and the Alliance would agree to a winner-takes-all match at Survivor Series, with the losing side being forced to disband forever. But if Vince thought he had all of his soldiers ready to go for this one, he was very wrong, as just weeks prior to the bout, Kurt Angle would jump ship too, teaming with the enemy now as Shane, Stephanie, and Paul Heyman were all able to gloat over what they'd pulled off. And this led to November 18th then, where, prior to the main event, Edge would defeat Tess to unify the Intercontinental and United States Championships, the Dudley Boys would pin the Hardys to unify both companies' tag team titles, and Trish Stratus would win a six-pack challenge to become the first women's champion since China had vacated the belt in May. Then, with it all coming down to one five-on-five -five encounter, the main event would see Team Alliance, made up of Steve Austin, Kurt Angle, Booker T, Rob Van Dam, and Shane McMahon, take on Team WWF, made up of The Rock, Chris Jericho, The Undertaker, Kane, and The Big Show. Of course, this highlighted the big issue with the Invasion story by then, as during this final battle, only one single WCW original was in the ring. And of course, come the end, it all came down to WWF's top two guys, as Steve Austin and The Rock went at it once more, with the People's Champion ending up getting the win for his side when Kurt Angle screwed his teammate, revealing himself then to have been a double agent all along. So with the invasion now mercifully over, and the likes of Shane, Stephanie, and Paul Heyman all kayfabe fired, WWF could finally reign tall, with them choosing to retcon much of what had happened over the past year the next night on Raw, when they quietly turned Austin babyface again and had Angle revert back to his heelish ways. Then, in one of the biggest, why didn't this happen earlier moments in wrestling history, Ric Flair would come out the night after WCW officially died to announce that he had bought stock in WWF prior to the bout, with the result of this being he was now a 50-50 owner of the company with Vince McMahon. And that would all lead to the final show of the year where, with there only being one company left standing, it was determined that there should only be one world champion going forward too. So at December 9th's Vengeance pay-per-view, there would be a one-night tournament featuring Steve Austin, The Rock, Chris Jericho, and Kurt Angle, with the winner of this being crowned the first ever undisputed world champion. Before that would happen though, Jeff and Matt Hardy would come to blows in a sibling squabble, the Dudley boys, who now had a new addition to their act in the form of Stacey Keebler, would defend their tag team titles against The Big Show and Kane, the Undertaker would pin Rob Van Dam to become the Hardcore Champion, and Trish Stratus would successfully defend her women's title against Jacqueline. Then, in the WWF World Title match, Steve Austin would score the pinfall over Kurt Angle, with this immediately being followed up by Chris Jericho getting a surprise victory over The Rock in the WCW World Title match. And with that, it came down to Austin vs. Jericho to see who the Undisputed Champion would be, about which, despite it seeming like the rattlesnake had things in hand at various points, would ultimately end when an interference spot from Booker T led to Jericho getting the win, putting him in the history books forever thereafter as the first man to unify the WWF and WCW world titles. After that, Austin would spin off into a feud with Booker that saw the two have a very memorable supermarket brawl, all while Jericho would attempt to establish himself as the top dog by taking on his first challenger. 
That, however, is a story for another day, because with 2001 drawing to a close at this point, we'll have to put a pin in things for now. Yes, it was an eventful year. One where, with the Attitude Era coming to an end and a once-thought home run angle of WWF vs WCW failing miserably, people began to wonder if maybe Vince McMahon wasn't as infallible as he had once seemed. And as we would see over the 12 months which followed, he would end up throwing a lot at the wall in an attempt to prove he still had that Midas touch, with some of this working, although other parts led to him being forced to get the F out. 2002 was a year of great change. In the world of film, we would see the modern age of superhero movies begin with the release of Sam Raimi's Spider-Man. In television, we were first introduced to The Wire, and over in the world of wrestling, these changes would present themselves in the form of new names, new brand divisions, and a lethal dose of poison. But how did it all happen? Well, join us today as we take a deep dive into the entire story from start to finish in the WWE in 2002, A Year in Review. When we last left off, the invasion angle had died a whimpering death with WWF left the ultimate victors. Ric Flair was the new kayfabe co-owner of the company alongside Vince McMahon, and Chris Jericho had just become the first ever undisputed world champion after beating The Rock and Steve Austin in one night. That said, his celebrations would prove to be short-lived because at the Royal Rumble on January 20th, he'd be forced to defend this belt against the Great One all over again. As well as this, Triple H had just made his return to the company after almost a year on the shelf, with him now being pushed as a massive babyface on the level of Stone Cold Steve Austin himself. So that was why it was such a big deal that those two would be entering the Rumble match itself that night, with each hoping to secure a spot in the main event of WrestleMania come the end of things. Before we would get there though, the undercard would see Spike Dudley and Taz defend their recently won World Tag Team titles against the Dudley Boys, William Regal win the Intercontinental title from Edge, and Vince McMahon and Ric Flair go to war in a street fight. Then, once that was done, Chris Jericho would defy the odds when he scored a screwy pinfall victory over The Rock, all before the Rumble itself would see such memorable moments as Maven eliminating The Undertaker, Mr. Perfect returning, and Triple H ultimately coming out on top after last eliminating Kurt Angle. Of course, even if the game was now in the WrestleMania main event, it wouldn't stop Stone Cold from getting one more shot at the gold when, after defeating Kurt Angle on the January 28th episode of Raw, he'd become the number one contender, with his match against Y2J being set for No Way Out on February 17th. But that wasn't even the big story heading into this one, because after feeling like he needed to rid the WWF of Ric Flair once and for all, Vince McMahon would decide to inject his company with a lethal dose of poison by bringing in the NWO, a decision which was met with legit hesitation behind the scenes. And that was because, in WCW's latter days, Hulk Hogan, Scott Hall, and Kevin Nash had contributed heavily towards the company's death, what with their abuse of backstage power and attitude problems often making it difficult for anything to get done. Still, with Vince being the final say on everything up north, he believed he could corral the stable, and that was why he'd feel safe in reintroducing them to audiences at No Way Out here having them do an interview segment at the start of the show, then a backstage skit with The Rock not long after this. As far as The Rock was concerned though, he had bigger things to worry about because he'd have a match with The Undertaker that night, with this one being part of an undercard which also saw William Regal defeat Edge once more and Rob Van Dam score a victory over Goldust. After that then, the first of two main events would feature Triple H going one-on-one -on -one with Kurt Angle, with this one seeing the game being handicapped after Stephanie McMahon named herself the special guest referee. Of course, the reason this was a handicap was because, upon having lied about being pregnant to her husband, Triple H had kicked her to the curb, sparking a feud between the two. And with this ultimately being too much for the Royal Rumble winner to overcome, he'd eat the loss that night as things moved on to the final match where Chris Jericho would defend his undisputed world title against Steve Austin. But while Austin appeared to have this one at points, an interference spot from the NWO would ultimately put a halt to this, allowing Y2J to walk out as champion and Stone Cold to splinter off into a feud with Scott Hall instead. And that would start the build to WrestleMania 18 where, not only would the Rattlesnake face off against Hall, but Hulk Hogan would lay down the challenge to The Rock to see who really was the biggest mainstream star in all of wrestling history. 
Yes, it was the dream match to end all dream matches and one fans thought they'd never see. But that wasn't all that was going on during this stacked card on March 17th as, elsewhere, Rob Van Dam would win the Intercontinental title from William Regal, Diamond Dallas Page would finally get his WrestleMania match against Christian, and Billy and Chuck would defend the WWF Tag Team titles in a Four Corners elimination match. As well as that, Edge and Booker T would fight over the right to appear in a shampoo commercial, Jazz would beat Trish Stratus and Lita to come out of the event as women's champion, and The Undertaker would take his streak to 10 and all after beating Ric Flair. Then following this, Steve Austin would get a convincing win over Scott Hall, and The Rock and Hulk Hogan would steal the show in an absolutely electric match which still probably ranks as having the greatest sustained crowd reaction of all time. Of course, that wouldn't be the last bout of the night though. No, that would come when Chris Jericho, now with Stephanie McMahon in his corner, would take on Triple H for the undisputed world title. And while this one was ultimately marred by the crowd having been worn out from just watching Rock vs. Hogan, it would see the game finally come out the victor by the close as he started his reign on top. But there was little time for him to celebrate this as, in the weeks that followed, big changes would be on the horizon for WWF. Yes, while well Brock Lesnar, with Paul Heyman by his side, was making a devastating debut of his own, and Steve Austin was legit no-showing the next couple of episodes of TV in frustration over his relatively diminished role at WrestleMania, Vince McMahon and Ric Flair would shake things up even further when they announced the brand extension, something which effectively split the company into two divisions going forward as Raw and SmackDown would now have exclusive rosters. So with Flair taking over the red brand and McMahon helming the blue one then, the first draft would see the roster pretty much cut down the middle as the likes of Steve Austin, The Undertaker, and the remaining members of the NWO became Raw exclusives, and The Rock, Hulk Hogan, and Kurt Angle became SmackDown only. Yes, we say the remaining members of the NWO, because after losing to The Rock at the Showcase of the Immortals, the Hulkster would see the error of his ways and revert to his red and yellow babyface ways once more and this then would quickly rocket him up to the number one contendership spot as, at April 21st's Backlash, he'd take on Triple H for the undisputed world title. That's right, after almost a decade of being out of the title scene in WWF, Hogan was now back in it. But before we get there, the rest of the card would see Raw and SmackDown alternate matches when Eddie Guerrero won the Intercontinental title from Rob Van Dam, The Undertaker defeated Steve Austin, and Brock Lesnar made a splash by destroying Jeff Hardy. Then in the main event, it would be out with the new and in with the old, as in a moment of pure nostalgia, Hulk Hogan would defeat Triple H to start one more run on top, something which was more than welcomed by all the fans watching in the arena that night. Of course, what they wouldn't welcome, however, was the fact that, after the World Wildlife Fund filed lawsuit against WWF for continued illegal use of their moniker in Europe, Vince McMahon would be forced to change the name of the company on May 6th, with the boss deciding to get the F out of here and rebrand things as WWE instead. So this then meant that the company's foray over to the UK on May 4th for Insurrection would be the last time they ever got to use the WWF name, as by the time they got to Judgment Day on May 19th, it would be a whole new world. And that new world would see Brock Lesnar continue to dominate when he beat both Hardy Boys at once, Edge forced Kurt Angle to shave himself bald after defeating him in a hair versus hair match, and Steve Austin slide down into the mid-card continue as he got the better of the Big Show and Ric Flair in a handicap bout. Then, inside Hell in a Cell, Triple H and Chris Jericho would go to war once again, with the game winning for a second time here after hitting a pedigree on the roof of the cage. But that wasn't the main event of the night, of course. No, that would come when The Undertaker and Hulk Hogan battled it out over the undisputed world title. And while Hogan would give it his all in this one, the power of Hulkamania would prove to be no match for Big Evil in 2002 as, come the end, the dead man would be the new champion. Yes, for as much as things had been forced to change on a corporate level, it looks like the company was ultimately going to go on without a hitch creatively. That was until Steve Austin decided to no-show the June 10th episode of Raw in protest of the fact he'd been asked to lose to Brock Lesnar clean in an unadvertised King of the Ring qualifier. Now, it wasn't that the Rattlesnake had any problems putting Brock over, of course. No, he just felt that a star of his magnitude deserved to have such a loss mean more than to have it happen in a throwaway match on a random episode of Raw. 
And that was why, with his frustrations already having been building for months at this point, he'd choose to quit the company altogether, forcing Vince McMahon to make a statement on the following week's episode of The Red Brand to address the whole situation. Yes, Austin was gone, and at the time at least, it looked like he was gone for good. So with a huge main event hole now being left, it would be up to a new star to rise to the top, as at the next pay-per-view of the year, June 23rd's King of the Ring, Brock Lesnar would mow through Test and Rob Van Dam on the same night to take the titular crown and make himself number one contender to the undisputed world title in the process. But this wasn't the only thing worthy of note which was happening on that show because elsewhere, Jamie Noble would become the new cruiserweight champion after defeating the Hurricane, Molly Holly would pin Trish Stratus to win the women's title, and Kurt Angle would raise his stock even higher by scoring a rare submission victory over Hulk Hogan. Then, in the main event, with The Rock sitting a ringside for commentary, Triple H would challenge The Undertaker for the undisputed world title, with the dead man retaining here to continue his run on top of the mountain for a little while longer. Of course, one run that was coming to an end by that point was the NWO, as after Hulk Hogan had left the group, the whole thing had floundered despite new members such as X-Pac, Booker T, and The Big Show being added. So that was why, on the July 15th episode of Raw, Vince McMahon would come out to announce that, with him finally having vanquished Ric Flair from his management role after the Nature Boy had decided to become a full-time wrestler once again, he was formally dissolving the New World Order. But it wasn't as if another former WCW figure wasn't about to step in and take his place, of course, because only moments later, the boss would announce that from now on, Raw and SmackDown would have general managers. And as far as the red brand was concerned, that GM would be none other than the former head of World Championship Wrestling, Eric Bischoff. Yes, the sight of McMahon and Bischoff hugging at the top of the entranceway was a sign to many that hell had frozen over. And with Easy e now taking over Raw and Stephanie McMahon doing the same over on SmackDown, the Ruthless Aggression Era would be able to start up just in time for July 21st's Vengeance, where only a month after John Cena had made his SmackDown debut by challenging Kurt Angle, he'd score a major victory when he defeated Chris Jericho in a singles match. After that, while Shawn Michaels was trying to help his old friend Triple H decide which brand to sign with full-time following his loss of the undisputed world title a couple of months prior, The Undertaker, Kurt Angle, and The Rock would have one of the best triple threat matches in WWE history over the top prize. And come the end of this one, it would be the People's Champion who stood tall, with this setting up Rock vs. Brock at SummerSlam just one month later. Before that would happen though, WWE would venture over to Australia for the Global Warming Tour, all before they then returned stateside as Eric Bischoff set about unifying all of the singles titles on Raw. And this would mean that after defeating then-hardcore champion Tommy Dreamer and European champion Jeff Hardy in separate bouts, Rob Van Dam would merge these with the Intercontinental title, causing the former two belts to be retired going forward. But while this was game-changing for the company's mid-card, there was an even bigger story happening on the red brand at this point as it happened, because after being forced to retire four years prior due to a back injury, Shawn Michaels would announce that he was returning to the ring once more, this time to face off against Triple H after the game had turned heel on him and laid him out. Yes, as if enough hadn't already happened in 2002, now Shawn Michaels was coming back. And after much hype then, his return match would end up happening at August 25th SummerSlam where, proving he hadn't lost a single step, HBK would go to war with his friend turned foe in a brutal and brilliant street fight, ultimately coming out the winner by the end. But of course, there's a reason why many people still consider this to be the greatest SummerSlam event of all time, and it's far more than just one five-star match. Now on top of this, the card also featured the likes of Kurt Angle and Rey Mysterio opening the show with an instant classic, Ric Flair submitting Chris Jericho, and The Undertaker getting one over on test. Then in the main event, The Rock would defend the undisputed world title against Brock Lesnar, someone who had been continuing his rookie warpath in the weeks leading up to this when he gained a technical submission victory over Hulk Hogan. So. When it came time to take on the Great One then, Brock was ready, as over the course of 16 minutes, he'd proved to be so impressive that he actually turned the Rock heel with the live crowd. And once he'd had enough of toying with his prey then, he'd hit the champ with an F5 and pick up the pin to become the youngest ever WWE Champion at the time. As for the Rock though, well, he'd formally turn heel on the live crowd after the bout, all before then announcing that he was leaving again for the foreseeable future so as to film another movie. 
But while the Great One might have been gone, it wouldn't slow down the progress of the show. As in the weeks that followed, Eric Bischoff and Stephanie McMahon would each begin plotting to sign up the new champ to an exclusive contract, leaving the other side without a world champion in the process. And eventually, it would be Stephanie who would be successful in doing this, a decision which led to Easy e being forced to revive the big gold belt when, on the September 2nd episode of Raw, he awarded it to Triple H and named him the new World Heavyweight Champion. Needless to say then, this garnered massive heel heat for the game and led to the start of his reign of terror, a period which would see him spend the next year and a half running roughshod over the red brand and burying every opponent he came up against in an attempt to turn himself into Harley Race. And the first opponent who would feel this wrath would be Rob Van Dam as it happened, because in September 22nd's Unforgiven, he would take on and defeat the former ECW star. All well elsewhere, Brock Lesnar was going to a no contest with The Undertaker over the now renamed WWE Championship. Aside from that, 3 Minute Warning would defeat Billy and Chuck in a match that was built off the back of both SmackDown's gay wedding segment and Raw's hot lesbian action earlier that month. Trish Stratus would regain the women's title from Molly Holly, and Kurt Angle would have yet another Matt Classic with Chris Benoit. Of course, after this bout, the two old grappling foes would gain such a respect for each other that they'd decide to team up when SmackDown announced they were going to hold a tournament to crown the first ever WWE Tag Team Champions, with this coming about after the World Tag Team titles had become exclusive to Raw. And the finals of this tournament would end up taking place at October 20th's No Mercy, where in one of the greatest tag matches in WWE history, Angle and Benoit would face off against Edge and Rey Mysterio, eventually beating them after just over 22 minutes to become the inaugural title holders. Yes, the NWO weren't the only ex-WCW guys who'd joined Vince McMahon's promotion this year, because now, with all the Time Warner contracts starting to run out, others would start jumping over too, with Mysterio being one of the most prominent among these. That said, his rise to the main event of SmackDown would have to wait for a couple of years yet, because for now, the Blue Brand's main event of this show would see the Brock Lesnar-Undertaker rematch, this time inside of Hell in a Cell. And after having one of the best Cell matches ever seen then, all without ever having to leave its confines, it would be the Beast who continued to stand tall come the end. But he wasn't the only champion who would retain that night, because over on the Raw side, Triple H would unify the World Heavyweight and Intercontinental titles when he pinned Kane, with this one coming about after the infamous Katie Vick storyline saw the Big Red Machine be revealed as a murderer and alleged necrophiliac. Yes, lesbians and necrophilia, 2002 was certainly an interesting time for WWE. That said, they could still hit a home run when they wanted to, something which was evident when, after one final tour over to the UK for Rebellion on October 26th, they'd return to America in time for November 17th's Survivor Series inside their spiritual home of Madison Square Garden. But what made this one so special? Well, after his triumphant comeback at SummerSlam earlier in the year, Shawn Michaels would hit the ring once more to take part in the first ever Elimination Chamber match. That's right, the Elimination Chamber, part Hell in a Cell, part War Games, and one of the most enduring gimmick bouts the company has produced in the last few decades. And in that first iteration, it would be Raw's World Heavyweight title put on the line as Triple H defended against HBK, Rob Van Dam, Chris Jericho, Kane, and Booker T. Before we would get there though, the rest of the card would see multiple titles change hands when Billy Kidman pinned Jamie Noble to win the Cruiserweight title, Victoria beat Trish Stratus to take home the women's title, Los Guerreros snabbed the WWE Tag Team titles during a triple threat bout with the other four members of the SmackDown 6, and perhaps most shockingly, Brock Lesnar ate his first pinfall loss on the main roster when Paul Heyman turned his back on him and sided with his opponent that night, The Big Show. Yes, just as he'd done at the same event three years prior, The Big Show had won the WWE Championship. But even that wouldn't be the last title change of the night, because in the Elimination Chamber match which closed the show, the boyhood dream would come true all over again when, after surviving five other men, Shawn Michaels would temporarily end the reign of terror when he won the World Heavyweight Championship for the first and only time in his career. And that would all lead us to the final pay-per-view of the year, Armageddon on December 15th, 
because there, after a great undercard saw Booker T and Goldust win the World Tag Team titles, Chris Benoit get the better of Eddie Guerrero in a predictably excellent singles match, and Evolution begin to take shape when Batista, with Ric Flair by his side, pinned Kane, the two world title matches would take place. On the SmackDown side then, it would be Kurt Angle going one-on-one -on -one with The Big Show, a match which saw the Olympic hero and the Giants' one-month reign to start his third reign on top. After that, Triple H and Shawn Michaels would go to war in a three stages of hell match, with the game winning the first fall, a street fight, and HBK winning the second one, a steel cage match. Then in the final fall, a ladder match, the two spent performers would give everything they had left, with it ultimately ending when Triple H came out on top as, with his reign of terror far from over, he'd close out the year as the World Heavyweight Champion once more. And that's where we'll end for today too then, because with this marking the last big show of the year, we'll pause things for now and pick it up again at a later time. Was it a perfect year? No, but with so much being thrown at the wall as the company tried to reignite the boom period, it was always going to be a case of having some hits and some misses. And even if the glory days were now starting to fall away, that's not to say there wasn't a lot of great things still to come yet, because with the ruthless aggression era now hitting its stride, 2003 was going to see the next generation of stars start to rise to the forefront. 2003 was a huge year in pop culture. In the world of film, we would see Peter Jackson close out the Lord of the Rings trilogy. In music, 50 Cent became a superstar with his debut album, Get Rich or Die Trying. And meanwhile, in the WWE, the growing war between Raw and SmackDown was keeping fans invested as, with the Attitude Era now a thing of the past, the Ruthless Aggression Era fully began to take shape, with a whole new crop of talent rising to the forefront. But how did it all happen? Well, join us today as we take a deep dive into the entire story from start to finish in the wwe in 2003 a year in review when we last left off the brand split had created two world champions triple h on raw and kurt angle over on smackdown on top of that brock lesnar had just turned babyface after he was screwed by his now former advocate paul Heyman. So heading into the first big show of the year then, the Royal Rumble on January 19th, Brock would make it his mission to win the titular match and book himself a spot in the main event of WrestleMania to get his WWE title back. Before he'd get the chance to do this though, the undercard on that night would see the Dudley Boys defeat Lance Storm and William Regal to win the World Tag Team titles, and Tori Wilson's feud with Dawn Marie over her father intensify when the two had a singles match. Then, after that, on the Raw side, the World Heavyweight title would be put up for grabs when Triple H went up against Scott Steiner, someone who had come into the company a couple of months prior to much fanfare. Unfortunately though, during this match, it quickly became apparent that Steiner could no longer go in the ring to a high level, and so after a disastrous bout which lasted 17 minutes, he'd be pinned cleanly by the defending champion. But that wasn't the only world title match occurring as, following this, Kurt Angle would successfully defend the WWE title against Chris Benoit in a match which, unlike the one before it, pretty much stole the show. Of course, Angle was helped by the fact that, by then, he'd picked up Paul Heyman as his new manager, something Brock Lesnar took note of as he headed into the main event. In fact, it was perhaps here he decided that, should he get the win, he'd want to get his revenge on the former ECW boss by taking the title away from his newest client. First, he'd have to beat 29 other men in the Rumble itself though, a tall task giving the caliber of wrestlers who were in it. That said, in the end, the beast proved to be too much for all of them, with him ending up winning the whole thing after last eliminating The Undertaker. So, with him confirming that he'd be taking on Angle at WrestleMania soon thereafter, at least one main event was set for that night. As for the other ones though, they'd still be up in the air, because with Raw seeming like it was losing the battle between the brands, Eric Bischoff decided he was going to try and bring back Stone Cold Steve Austin as to give his show a boost. Yes, after almost a year, the situation which led to the Rattlesnake's walkout had cooled enough to where he could be put in a room with Vince McMahon again and a return to the company could be worked out. But that wasn't the only big return during this month however, as over on SmackDown, as a way of trying to get into the head of his rival Hulk Hogan, the boss would bring in the very man who had beaten him at WrestleMania the year prior, The Rock, so the two could have the rematch of the century at No Way Out on February 23rd. 
And heading into that night then, the excitement levels were sky high as people wanted to see both Rock Hogan 2 and the return of Stone Cold. Before that would happen, however, Brock Lesnar and Chris Benoit would team up to defeat Team Angle in a handicap match, and Triple H would put the brief main event run of Scott Steiner to bed once and for all in their rematch. Then, as everyone in attendance watched before Eric Bischoff came down to the ring, they knew it was only a matter of time until that glass would shatter and their hero would return. And when it did, the roof just about blew off the place as Austin proceeded to come out and beat the ever-loving hell out of the Raw GM, announcing that he was back in the fold. But this wasn't the main event of the night, however, because following that, Rock Hogan 2 would take place, with this one proving to be unable to live up to the magic of the original, as after 12 minutes, the Great One would pick up the win again. Of course, the victory was partially achieved with the help of a distraction from Vince McMahon, something which set up his eventual bout with the Hulkster at WrestleMania a month later. Before we would get there, though, the rest of the card would take shape on the next few weeks of Raw and SmackDown, when after having a mini-feud with the Hurricane, The Rock would challenge the Rattlesnake to one more showdown at the Showcase of the Immortals. On top of that, Booker T would become the number one contender to Triple H's World Heavyweight title, though the storyline that led us there is one which courted much controversy. And that's because of the racial undertones to the whole thing. With this being the game's reign of terror though, when WrestleMania 19 came on March 30th, he'd walk out with the same belt he came in with after pinning his opponent clean in the middle of the ring. Still though, there were happy moments to be taken out of what is perhaps the most underrated WrestleMania of all time, as not only was The Undertaker taking his streak to 11-0 when he beat The Big Show and A-Train in a handicap match, but Shawn Michaels and Chris Jericho would have a 5-star classic which saw the Heartbreak Kid come out the victor by the end. On top of that, titles would change hands when Trish Stratus defeated Victoria to become the women's champion, and Shelton Benjamin and Charlie Haas became the WWE Tag Team Champions after winning a triple threat match. Then in a street fight, after Rowdy Roddy Piper made a surprise return, Hulk Hogan would get the better of Vince McMahon, all before Steve Austin and The Rock went one more round, with this one ending in the Great One picking up the victory and sending the Rattlesnake off into retirement. Yes, no one knew it at the time, but with injuries finally catching up to him, Austin had decided that this would be his retirement bout. Of course, he wasn't the only one going into this show injured, however, because in the weeks leading up to the main event, a serious neck injury would almost force Kurt Angle to vacate the belt before he could even get in the ring. In the end, though, seemingly being made of adamantium, Angle would gut it out enough to take on Lesnar for the WWE title. Come the close of that bout though, despite Brock getting the win and becoming the new champ, it would be his health people were worried about when a botched shooting star press almost killed him in the middle of the ring. So, with both men now being on the shelf for the immediate future, WWE would have to pivot somewhat by having SmackDown focus on not only the saga of Vince McMahon and the mysterious Mr. America, but also the introduction of one-legged wrestler Zach Gowan. Meanwhile, over on Raw, with Steve Austin now being retired from in-ring competition, he'd move over into a new role as that show's Sheriff, someone put in place to counteract the heelish antics of Eric Bischoff. But the red brand would have yet another ace up its sleeve as it happened, because the night after WrestleMania, while The Rock was celebrating his victory over his greatest rival, Goldberg would make his WWE debut and immediately lay out the challenge to the People's Champion. So, at Backlash on April 27th, it would be The Rock vs. Goldberg in the main event, with the former WCW star starting off his run strong here by demolishing his opponent and sending him back to Hollywood for the foreseeable future. Of course, that wasn't the only notable thing happening on this show, however, as elsewhere, Kane and Rob Van Dam would retain their World Tag Team titles against the Dudley Boys, Jazz would defeat Trish Stratus to become the new Women's Champion, and John Cena's ascent towards face of the company would begin when he challenged the newly returned Brock Lesnar for the WWE title. And while Brock would win this one, Cena's rise would continue, as at May 18th's Judgment Day just one month later, he'd score a big victory when he teamed up with the FBI to defeat Chris Benoit, Rhino, and Spanky. Aside from that, the rest of this show would see Eddie Guerrero and Tajiri become WWE Tag Team Champions after they beat Shelton Benjamin and Charlie Haas, Christian win a battle royal for the newly re-established Intercontinental title, Tori Wilson and Sable have a bikini challenge, and Mr. America get one over on Roddy Piper in a singles match, brother. 
Then, in the main event, each world champion would retain when Kevin Nash was only able to defeat Triple H by disqualification and Brock Lesnar managed to beat the Big Show in a stretcher match. Of course, the game knew that sooner or later he was going to have to take on Goldberg, though, and that was why, after the company took a trip over to the UK for insurrection on June 7th, he began to rally his troops behind him as Evolution, a group which had been percolating for some months prior to this, fully began to take hold of the Red Brand. So when Bad Blood came just one week later on June 15th, then two of the group's members, Ric Flair and Randy Orton, would work together to get the Nature Boy a pinfall victory over Shawn Michaels. Then after that, despite Triple H being locked inside Hell in a Cell as he went one-on-one -on -one with Kevin Nash once more, they'd be in his corner regardless and help motivate him to keep the World Heavyweight title around his waist come the end of the night. Of course, there would be other matches not involving Evolution on this first ever Raw-only card too, perhaps the most notable of which was Chris Jericho's encounter with Goldberg, with this playing off a real-life fight the two had years prior while working for WCW. On top of that, La Resistance and Booker T would gain ground when they became the new World Tag Team Champions and Intercontinental Champion respectively, all while Scott Steiner's slide into mid-card irrelevance continued with a victory over Test, which earned him the managerial services of Stacey Keebler. And with the Raw side getting this pay-per-view all to themselves, it meant that SmackDown would miss out for a month. So, in an attempt to rectify this, July 27th's Vengeance would be exclusive to the Blue brand and would feature a stacked card which saw Eddie Guerrero defeat Chris Benoit to win the newly reintroduced United States title, a newly returned Sable get the better of SmackDown general manager Stephanie McMahon in a one-on-one -on -one encounter, John Cena's rise continue with an impressive showing against The Undertaker, and a truly bizarre encounter take place when a 58-year-old Vince McMahon, fresh off ridding the company of Mr. America, beat a one-legged Zach Gowan in a singles bout. That said, the real reason people tuned into this show was for the main event, as after undergoing successful neck surgery and returning to the ring in record time, Kurt Angle would get his rematch with Brock Lesnar as part of a triple threat match, which also included The Big Show. Why was The Big Show added to this one? Well, after he and Brock had gone to a no contest when they quite literally broke the ring during a match on SmackDown a few weeks prior, it was determined he deserved another shot at the goal. In the end, though, it would be the Olympic hero who came out of this one on top, with this marking his fourth reign as champion. Not that it would be the end of his feud with Lesnar, of course. No, uh, far from it, in fact, because after already facing off both in the ring at WrestleMania 19 and behind the scenes in a legit amateur shoot competition sometime prior to this, each still had a desire to prove that they were better than the other when it came to going one-on-one. -on -one. So when SummerSlam came around on August 24th, the two would meet again, this time with no involvement from the big show. And on that night, it would prove to be Angle who was the better man as, after just over 21 minutes, he submitted the Beast with an ankle lock. Elsewhere, meanwhile, Kane, who had been forced to unmask a few weeks before this upon losing a World Heavyweight title match against Triple H, would take on his now former partner Rob Van Dam, with the Big Red Machine unleashing all of his rage here and showing the WWE fan base that he was going to be a force to be reckoned with once more. Then after that, Shane McMahon would make his in-ring return when he defeated Eric Bischoff, all before the main event saw the top six stars on Raw battle it out over the World Heavyweight title inside the Elimination Chamber. Yes, Triple H would be forced to defend here against Shawn Michaels, Kevin Nash, Chris Jericho, and Goldberg. And while he would have his Evolution ally Randy Orton in the match to help him out, by then, most fans were expecting this to be Goldberg's moment to reach the top of the mountain. After all, following a rocky start with the company, he'd finally begun picking up momentum. It's just a shame then that all this momentum would be halted by the Reign of Terror when, after just over 19 minutes, he'd be the last man eliminated by the game. Should he have won here in hindsight? Absolutely. But at this point, what Triple H wanted, Triple H got. So, deciding he needed to hold on to the belt for a little while longer, he'd walk out of the night still the champ. Luckily then, over on SmackDown, the WWE title was having a much better time of it as, on the September 18th episode of The Blue Brand, Kurt Angle and Brock Lesnar would go at it again in an Iron Man match, one of the best matches ever given away on free TV, and one which saw the Beast ultimately come out of things the new top dog after a 5-4 victory. 
And while both men would then splinter off into doing their own separate things for a while from there, they wouldn't get the chance to appear on pay-per-view that month as, instead, on September 21st, it would be Raw's turn when they held Unforgiven. Of course here, while the undercard would see the Dudley boys win the World Tag Team titles from La Resistance, Randy Orton score a big-time win over Shawn Michaels, and Kane continue his dominating assault over the Red Brand's roster when he beat Shane McMahon in a Last Man Standing match, it would be all about the main event, where finally, Goldberg and Triple H were going to go one-on-one. -on -one. But while Goldberg would win this match to become the World Heavyweight Champion and temporarily put a pause to the Reign of Terror, it would end up being one month too late for fans as, by this point, most of the momentum the former WCW star had built up was gone. Yes, while it would have seemed nearly impossible to screw Bill Goldberg up, WWE seemed to have found a way to do it. So as he was continuing to feud with Evolution over on Raw, a group which were now strengthened even further following Batista's return from injury, SmackDown would pick up the slack when, on October 19th, they hosted No Mercy. And on this show, the blue brand would prove to be the superior one, as after an undercard which saw the big show win the United States title from Eddie Guerrero, John Cena reached another level of popularity again when he took Kurt Angle to the limit, and Vince McMahon defeated his daughter Stephanie, sending her packing from her role as SmackDown general manager just days prior to her real-life wedding with Triple H. The main event would feature a brutal biker chain match pitting WWE champion Brock Lesnar against number one contender The Undertaker. And over the course of the next 24 minutes then, the two would pick up exactly where they'd left off the year prior by pummeling each other into the ground, with the whole thing eventually ending when the Beast, with a little help from his newest ally Vince McMahon, was able to outlast his opponent and retain the title. Then, to make matters better, after this, the champ's time would get a whole lot easier as, with Paul Heyman replacing Stephanie McMahon as the SmackDown general manager and immediately mending fences with his former client, he'd make it his mission to stop Big Evil from getting a rematch. That said, while he may not have been able to get another shot at the title, The Undertaker would still get a big-time bout at November 16th's Survivor Series because there, he would go one-on-one -on -one with the boss himself when he took on McMahon in a Buried Alive match. Before that happened though, the undercard would see Molly Holly retain the women's title in a bout against Lita, the Basham brothers do the same with the WWE tag titles when they took on Los Guerreros, and Kane and his feud with Shane McMahon once and for all when he beat him in an ambulance match. Then, once this was done, the battle for control of Raw would take place when Team Eric Bischoff, made up as it were of Randy Orton, Chris Jericho, Christian, Mark Henry, and Scott Steiner, took on Team Steve Austin, with this latter fivesome featuring Shawn Michaels, Booker T, Rob Van Dam, and the Dudleys. And while the star of this one would turn out to be the Heartbreak Kid when he ended up being the lone man left on his side, he wasn't able to overcome the odds, because after eliminating Christian and Chris Jericho single-handedly, an interference spot from Batista would allow Randy Orton to get the winning pinfall. But despite Austin now being out of his role as Sheriff of the Red Brand, he'd offer his thanks to HBK for the effort he gave anyway. And as the two were sharing a Steve Weiser backstage then, The Undertaker and Vince McMahon would make their way to the ring for their ultimate showdown. Of course, with the Buried Alive match being a bit of a specialty for Big Evil by this point, most expected him to win this one. So that's why it came as such a surprise then when, after a hard-fought battle which lasted just under 12 minutes and saw the boss gushing blood from the forehead after receiving a botched chair shot early on, an interference spot from Kane would lead to his brother being laid out and left prone to be buried six feet under. But while The Undertaker would disappear from WWE for several months at this point, it wasn't like there weren't other stars able to pick up the ball and run with it, because in the main event of the night, which immediately followed this, Goldberg and Triple H would go at it one more time, with the former WCW star being able to overcome the constant run-ins from Evolution here and cling on to his World Heavyweight title come the end of things. Yes, it was now feeling to some fans like maybe, just maybe, the reign of terror was over for good. What these people didn't realize at the time, though, was that, during the final Raw exclusive pay-per-view of the year, Armageddon on December 14th, the game would get one last shot at the gold. But this time, an extra spanner would be thrown into the works when Kane was added, turning the whole thing into a triple threat match. 
Of course, before that, the rest of Evolution would also find themselves in title bouts too on the undercard, as while Randy Orton was getting the challenge for Rob Van Dam's Intercontinental title, Batista and Ric Flair were taking part in a tag team turmoil match to determine the new WWE Tag Team Champions. And that wouldn't be the animal's only bout of the night either, as prior to this, he'd go one-on-one -on -one with Shawn Michaels. But despite losing this one, he would end up holding gold around his waist before the evening was over, the same of which could be said for both Flair and Orton too, as heading into the main event, it looked like the group were going to pull a clean sweep. So with all the pressure on him then, Triple H did everything he could to win his title back in the World Heavyweight title match, with him ultimately being able to do so after some well-timed interference spots from the rest of his partners in crime cleared the way for him. That's right, just like the year before, this one would also end with Triple H on top of the mountain and the reign of terror continuing. The only difference here was that, now the rest of Evolution had titles of their own as well, making them far and away the most dominating force on the red brand. And that's where we'll leave things for today because, aside from a brief stopover in Iraq to do a tribute to the Troops show a week later, this would be the last big event of the year for WWE. Sure, it might have been a year where, with fans tiring of the game's dominance over on Raw, as well as the poor booking of Goldberg and the in-ring exits of Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock, many continued to turn away from the product. Still, with the Lesnar angle feud, the continued great work from Chris Jericho, Chris Benoit, and Eddie Guerrero, and the slow rise of younger stars like John Cena, Randy Orton, and Dave Batista, those who were still hanging around remained confident that, even if it was in the middle of a difficult transitional period, the future remained bright for Vince McMahon's company. 2004 was a huge year in pop culture. In television, we would see the final season of Friends. Meanwhile, in music, Kanye West released his first studio album, The College Dropout. Meanwhile, over in the world of wrestling, it was out with the old and in with the new, because while some big stars were about to leave for the foreseeable future, new ones were ready to rise in their place. But how did it all happen? Well, join us today as we take a deep dive into the entire story from start to finish in the WWE in 2004, A Year in Review. When we last left off, Triple H's reign of terror had strengthened with the introduction of Evolution. Brock Lesnar was standing tall as the WWE Champion over on SmackDown, and The Undertaker had mysteriously disappeared from TV after losing a Buried Alive match to Vince McMahon. And this would lead us into the Royal Rumble on January 25th where, in the world title pictures, The Game would find himself defending against his old friend and foe Shawn Michaels in a last man standing match, all while The Beast was putting his title up on the line against a surprising challenger in Hardcore Holly. Before we get there though, the undercard would see Batista and Ric Flair defend the Raw Tag Team titles against the Dudley Boys, Rey Mysterio defeat Jamie Noble in a cruiserweight title match, and Los Guerreros come to blows when Eddie faced off against his nephew Chavo. Then after that, while Brock was predictably making short work of his challenger, Triple H and HBK would go for over 20 minutes before the champ finally came out on top. But that wasn't the last match of the night of course, no we still had the rumble itself to come. And here, after entering at number one and then lasting over an hour, it would be Chris Benoit who defied all the odds when he ended up being the last man left. So with him now having the choice of taking on either the Raw or SmackDown World Champion at WrestleMania, he'd have to ponder this carefully as the company headed into the second pay-per-view of the year, No Way Out, on February 15th. And with this one being a blue brand exclusive, it would focus on the final challenger for the WWE Champion prior to WrestleMania. But who was this challenger? Well, after winning a battle royal to earn the number one contendership spot on the January 29th episode of SmackDown, it would be Eddie Guerrero who challenged Brock here. Aside from that, the rest of the card would see Rikishi and Scotty Tuhati successfully defend their WWE Tag Team titles against the Basham Brothers, Chavo Guerrero win the Cruiserweight title after beating Rey Mysterio, and Kurt Angle get a big time win over both John Cena and The Big Show in a triple threat match. Still, for as big as these bouts were, it was the main event people were really interested in, as after overcoming numerous addiction issues and rebuilding his life, Latino Heat had finally worked his way up to the main event picture. That said, with this being only a month away from the showcase of the Immortals, and the heavy speculation being that Brock Lesnar was going to face Goldberg for the title there, few expected Eddie to win this one. 
and that's what made it so magic then when, after just under 30 minutes, he'd hit a frog splash and score the pinfall, all before jumping into the crowd to celebrate with his people in one of the most feel-good moments in WWE history. Yes, after so many years of struggling, Eddie was now at the top of the mountain as WWE Champion. But he couldn't rest easy, though, because just one month later at WrestleMania, he'd have to put that title on the line against Kurt Angle. Before we'd get there, though, the Hall of Fame would make a return for the first time in nearly two decades, with this new class including major names like Harley Race, superstar Billy Graham, Jesse the Body Ventura, and Bobby Heenan. But that was just the start of a packed weekend, because the very next night, on March 14th, WrestleMania 20 would take place from the company's spiritual home base of Madison Square Garden. And here, after the show had started with a bang with John Cena defeating the big show to win the United States title, things would get even wilder as Trish Stratus turned heel by aligning herself with Christian. The Rock had his last WWE bout for almost a decade when he teamed with Mick Foley to take on Randy Orton, Batista, and Ric Flair, and Molly Holly was shaved bald after losing to Victoria in a hair versus hair match. Then, in the first of many main events, Brock Lesnar and Goldberg would finally go one-on-one, -on -one, with the stipulation here being that, as neither man could be trusted to have a clean fight, Stone Cold Steve Austin was brought in to be the special guest referee. Unfortunately for everyone involved, however, it would leak out to the public prior to the bout that both Lesnar and Goldberg were planning to leave WWE after this one, with Brock in particular growing tired of the brutal schedule being demanded of him. So with fans realizing this, they'd rain down booze on the whole thing, causing each man to look visibly pissed throughout it and put no effort in as a result. Luckily though, the next main event would go better, as after having disappeared from the company for a while following the prior November Survivor Series, The Undertaker would make his triumphant return to face off against his brother, Kane. But this wasn't the biker incarnation of Mark Calloway which fans had grown used to over the last couple of years. No, much to their delight, this was the return of the dead man, complete with Paul Bearer by his side. So as the live audience lost their minds at seeing the Phenom come back to WWE after five years, he was only too happy to lay waste to his brother in just under seven minutes, taking his streak to 12-0 in the process. And with that done, it was left to the two world title matches, the first of which saw Eddie Guerrero successfully defend against Kurt Angle in characteristically dastardly fashion. Then, with fans pumped up over this, the last bout of the night would see Triple H defend the World Heavyweight title against not only Royal Rumble winner Chris Benoit, but also Shawn Michaels. And the reason for that was, with him and the game's feud still being left unresolved, he'd managed to insert himself into the whole situation. That said, he wouldn't end up walking away with the gold here as, after just over 24 minutes, it would be the Crippler who tapped out the champ so as to become the new top dog on Raw. But even that wasn't the end of the night because once this was done and Benoit was holding his newly won belt, his real-life best friend Guerrero would join him in the ring, as from there, the two celebrated together in a moment which, while magical at the time, has since pretty much been erased from history due to future events. Right then, though, no one knew what was to come, and so while Eddie continued to reign tall on the blue brand, Benoit would head into the next big Raw exclusive show of the year, April 18th's Backlash, ready to defend against Triple H and Shawn Michaels again in the rematch. Of course, with this event being in his home country of Canada, there was no chance he was going to lose the title here. And that was why, after a bout which was arguably even better than the first, he'd find himself coming out on top when he tapped out HBK with a sharpshooter. But that wasn't all that was going on on this show, as elsewhere, not only would Chris Jericho get a small measure of revenge over his former kayfabe girlfriend Trish Stratus and her new lover Christian, but Mick Foley would put his ongoing beef with Randy Orton to bed when the two went to war in a now legendary hardcore match over the Intercontinental title. Yes, this was the one which saw the legend killer fully prove he had what it took to be a main event force, as after beating Foley, his slow burn rise to the top continued to build momentum. That said, this storyline would have to be placed on the back burner for the next month because, since Raw had gotten backlash as a red brand exclusive, May 16th's Judgment Day would be SmackDown only. And this show would center on the WWE title feud between Eddie Guerrero and the newly rebranded JBL, with the former Bradshaw getting huge heat here by going after Latino Heat's Mexican heritage. Of course, given the nature of the storyline then, most expected the champ to come out of this one retaining. And while he did do this, the bigger concern by the close of the bout would be his health, as after taking a brutal chair shot mid-match, he'd lose a scary amount of blood, enough to where he'd need an emergency transfusion after things were over. 
But that's not the only notable thing which happened at this show. As elsewhere, The Undertaker would continue to re-establish himself as the big dog over on SmackDown when he scored a victory over Booker T, all while John Cena's rise picked up even more momentum when he defended his US title against Rene Dupree. And since they'd missed out this month, Raw would be happy to finally get their next pay-per-view, Bad Blood, on June 13th, during which Chris Benoit pulled double duty by not only teaming with Edge to challenge the World Tag Team Champions La Resistance, but also by successfully defending his World Heavyweight title against Kane. On top of that, Trish Stratus would win the women's title in a fatal four-way match that also featured Victoria, Lita, and Gail Kim, Randy Orton would defend the Intercontinental title against Shelton Benjamin, and fan favorite underdog Eugene would get his first pay-per-view victory when he pinned Jonathan Coachman. Then in the main event, Triple H and Shawn Michaels would finally put their beef to bed when they battled it out inside of Hell in a Cell, with Triple H coming out the victor here after 47 hard-fought minutes. So with that now over, each man could move on. But while Triple H was getting into a mini feud with Eugene over on Raw, and Shawn Michaels was segueing away from the main event scene for a while, SmackDown would also find themselves hosting their own pay-per-view this month as, for the first time, each brand put on a big event within the same 30-day period. So it was that, on June 27th at the Great American Bash, John Cena would start off the show by successfully defending his US title against Booker T, Rene Dupree, and Rob Van Dam in a fatal four-way match. Following this, Kurt Angle, who was then serving as the temporary general manager of the Blue Brand following an injury, would stand in the corner of newcomer Luther Reigns when he made short work of Charlie Haas. Then after that, the big WWE title rematch between Eddie Guerrero and JBL would take place. This time though, having learned from his prior loss, the challenger would be prepared for Latino heat once the bell rang. And that was why, after just over 19 minutes of their Texas Bull Rope match, he'd outcheat the cheater and shock everyone by becoming the new WWE Champion. But there was still more to come because, once the live crowd had a chance to let this sink in, they'd have to deal with an even bigger shock, as following his defeat of the Dudley Boys in a handicap match, The Undertaker would say goodbye to his longtime manager Paul Bearer when he buried him under six feet of cement. And now liberated from his manager then, the dead man would be free to focus on being the new number one contender to JBL's title at SummerSlam. Before we'd get there though, we'd have one more stop for the Raw brand, as on July 11th, they'd host Vengeance. Of course here, while the undercard saw Batista's slow rise continue with a victory over Chris Jericho, Edge become the new Intercontinental Champion after pinning Randy Orton, and Matt Hardy and Kane take their feud over Lita to pay-per-view, the main event would be all about Triple H's last chance to get a shot at Chris Benoit and his World Heavyweight title. So realizing that this was all or nothing, the game threw everything at the champ, but while this would force Benoit to dig deeper than he ever had before, it wouldn't be enough to see H get the win, as after an interference spot from Eugene towards the end of the bout, the champ would be able to execute a quick roll-up. And that then would finally lead us into SummerSlam on August 15th where, looking for revenge against the kayfabe nephew of Eric Bischoff, Triple H would take on Eugene one-on-one. -on -one. But that wasn't even half of what was going on during this card because elsewhere, Kane would score a victory over Matt Hardy, something which, as per the pre-match stipulation, meant Lita would be forced to marry him on a subsequent episode of Raw. Then, as if that wasn't wild enough, John Cena and Booker T would start out a very successful best of five series with a victory for the Doctor of Thugonomics, Edge retained the IC title in a triple threat match against Batista and Chris Jericho, Kurt Angle came back from injury to have a classic against Eddie Guerrero, and JBL managed to retain the WWE title on a technicality after The Undertaker got himself disqualified during their bout. But in the main event, the champion would not be so lucky because when Chris Benoit stepped in the ring with number one contender Randy Orton, he'd quickly realize his time had finally run out. And so, after just over 20 minutes then, it would be the legend killer who was able to do what Triple H could not when he pinned Benoit to become the youngest ever world champion in WWE history at just 24. Not that he'd have long to celebrate this though, because the very next night on Raw, furious that his protege had one-upped him, the game would kick the new champ out of evolution. And this would set up the main event for Unforgiven on September 12th, where the two now former stablemates would fight it out over the brand's top prize. But before that though, the undercard would see Chris Jericho get the better of Christian in a ladder match for the Intercontinental title, a title which had to be vacated weeks prior to this when Edge suffered a groin injury. 
Then in the main event, Triple H would prove he was still the man when, after 24 minutes and 47 seconds, he'd pick up a screwy pinfall over Orton, ending his world title run at just 28 days as the game started his own ninth reign on top. Yes, if you thought the reign of terror was over, you were very wrong, because in spite of it all, H still ruled the roost on Raw for the time being. Meanwhile, though, as all of this was happening, over on SmackDown, they'd have other things to worry about as they were preparing for October 3rd's No Mercy. And what did this show entail? Well, the undercard would see the blue brand attempt to create some new stars as Luther Reigns got a chance to shine against Eddie Guerrero in a singles match, and Rene Dupree and Kenzo Suzuki were able to defeat Rob Van Dam and Rey Mysterio for the WWE Tag Team titles. Of course, that wasn't to say the main event players didn't get a spot too, as later on in the show, The Big Show and Kurt Angle would go one-on-one, -on -one. John Cena and Booker T would close out their Best of Five series with another victory for the Doctor of Thugonomics, and in the main event, JBL would once again successfully defend against The Undertaker, proving to everyone that he was more than just a paper champion. Sure, he may have been battered and bloodied by the end of it, but a win was a win nonetheless. And this ultimately meant that, heading into Survivor Series in November, he'd have to face a new challenger in the form of Booker T. Before we'd get there, though, Raw would also get to host a pay-per-view in October, with this one having the gimmick that all the matches would be voted on by fans. Yes, this was the first edition of Taboo Tuesday on October 19th, a weekday show which gave fans three options to choose from when it came to things such as stipulations and opponents for each bout. And that would all lead to some interesting situations throughout the night, as after being chosen to face Chris Jericho for the Intercontinental title early on in the show, Shelton Benjamin would actually go on to win the belt, making fans feel like they were having a say in the company's booking decisions. On top of this, we'd get Gene Snitsky taking on Kane in a Weapon of Choice match, with this one coming about after Kane had kayfabe kidnapped and impregnated Lita, only for Snitsky to unintentionally then cause her to have a miscarriage. And no, we're not going to go into that whole can of worms here. Instead, we'll focus on the rest of the card, where Chris Benoit and Edge would become World Tag Team Champions when they were chosen to face off against La Resistance, and Eugene would get to shave Eric Bischoff's head, as per the fans' desires, after scoring a pinfall over him. But those bouts were all place setting for the two main events, because here, we would see Shawn Michaels get one more shot at Triple H and the World Heavyweight title after those voting decided he was worthy, and Randy Orton face off against Ric Flair inside a steel cage. And while Orton would win this latter bout, it didn't mean the night was a wash for Evolution, because at least the game would retain during his match. What he didn't realize at the time, though, was that the seeds of his ultimate destruction were already being sown, as on a subsequent episode of Raw, it would appear that Batista had turned on his leader, with this move drawing a huge reaction from the live crowd in attendance. Yes, it ultimately did turn out to be a trick Evolution was playing on Randy Orton, but taking note of how fans reacted to this, Vince McMahon would begin making plans for a big showdown the following year. Back in 2004, though, the next big show would be November 14th's Survivor Series, a show where, with both Raw and SmackDown performers being on the card, we'd get to see the best of both worlds. And that led to a series of matches where, while Shelton Benjamin was continuing his Raw Intercontinental title run with a victory over Christian, over on the blue brand side, The Undertaker was making short work of Heidenreich in a one-on-one -on -one match. Then after this, we'd get to see two world titles defended when Trish Stratus scored a victory over Lita in the women's division, and JBL, with the help of his cabinet, weaseled his way into getting another win in the men's when he took on Booker T. And of course, as was the tradition with this event, we'd also get to see two Survivor Series elimination matches, as over on the SmackDown side, Team Guerrero, made up as they were of Eddie Guerrero, The Big Show, Rob Van Dam, and John Cena, would defeat Team Angle, with this team including Kurt Angle, Mark Jindrak, Luther Reigns, and Carlito. Then over on the Raw Brands bout, fans would watch as Team Orton, made up of Randy Orton, Chris Benoit, Chris Jericho, and Maven, got the win over Team Triple H, with them being made up of the game, Batista, Edge, and Gene Snitsky. So with this done, and the Triple H-Orton feud now finally seeming like it could be put to bed for the time being, it meant that Raw could begin to start the build for the Royal Rumble in January. As for SmackDown, however, they'd have one more show to get yet, because on December 12th, they'd host the final pay-per-view of the year, Armageddon. And this one would see some pretty heated bouts take place as it happened, because after Carlito had gotten his henchman Jesus to kayfabe stab John Cena in a nightclub a few weeks prior, the Doctor of Thugonomics was out for revenge. 
Needless to say then, he did come out the victor by the end of his match with Jesus that night, as did The Big Show when he defeated Kurt Angle, Luther Reigns, and Mark Jindrak in a three-on-one handicap match. Elsewhere, meanwhile, two young tough enough competitors would get their first chance to shine on a pay-per-view when Daniel Pewter took on and defeated Mike Mizanin in a Dixie dogfight. And while it would be Mizanin who went on to greater fame as the years went on, at this moment you wouldn't have known it by looking at him as, being greener than grass still, it was still clear he had a lot of work to do yet if he wanted to become a top guy. Of course, if he'd watched the main event of the show, he would have learned a lot from those involved, because there, JBL would defend the WWE title in a fatal four-way match against Eddie Guerrero, Booker T, and The Undertaker. But still, despite the odds against him being overwhelming, the champ would manage to retain again by the time the closing bell had rung on this one, and this meant he'd get to have the honor of closing out the year as the top dog on the blue brand, because another brief visit to Iraq for a tribute to the troop show on December 18th aside, this would mark the end of WWE's year. Had it been a perfect year? No. In fact, it was clear by this point, with the Monday Night Wars being fully in the rearview mirror, much of what was happening on screen lacked the same excitement it had a couple of years prior. That said, it doesn't mean there weren't a lot of positives too, because even if big stars like Brock Lesnar and Goldberg had gone, and Triple H was continuing his stranglehold over the Raw brand, the next generation were coming along nicely, with Randy Orton in particular reaching the main event level here. And as we moved into 2005, that pattern would only continue, because just a few months later, two of the defining stars of the Ruthless Aggression era would have world titles around their waists as well. But that's a story for another day, as this is where we're going to cut things off for now, safe in the knowledge that what was going to happen over the next 12 months would shape ultimately what the company became across the next generation. In 2005, the world had fully settled into the new millennium, and so any trends of the 90s seemed to be fully gone, as the next generation of things took over. But while in the larger entertainment world this meant events such as the birth of YouTube and the release of the Xbox 360, in the world of wrestling, it meant the rise of two new figures, one of whom would go on to carry the company for the next two decades. But how did it all happen? Well, join us today as we take a deep dive into the entire story from start to finish in the WWE in 2005, A Year in Review. When we last left off, Triple H's reign of terror was ongoing over on Raw. JBL was enjoying a lengthy world title run on SmackDown, and the company was still searching for that next top babyface star in the wake of Brock Lesnar's exit the prior March. And that sets the scene for the first big show of the year then, New Year's Revolution, which took place on January 9th. Yes, for the first time, the Royal Rumble wouldn't open out the calendar, because with SmackDown getting the last exclusive show of 2004, Raw would get one of their own to start the following year with a bang. And being a Raw exclusive, this one would focus on the game's attempts to keep the World Heavyweight title around his waist as he took on Chris Jericho, Edge, Chris Benoit, former protege Randy Orton, and current protege Dave Batista in an Elimination Chamber match. Of course, by the end of this one, the champ would come out retaining. That said, over the course of it, the seeds would continue to be laid for Big Dave's eventual babyface turn. Aside from this, though, the rest of the card would see Kane continue his awful feud with Gene Snitsky over the supposed miscarriage of his kayfabe unborn son, Trish Stratus win the women's title from Lita after the now former champ legitimately injured herself mid-match, and Muhammad Hassan make a strong impression by defeating Jerry Lawler. But while he may have been strong here, he wouldn't be so lucky at the next pay-per-view of the year, the Royal Rumble, on January 30th, as there he'd be something of an afterthought in the Rumble match itself, with him lasting less than a minute before being eliminated. And he wasn't the only one having a bad night either, because prior to this in the show, not only would Randy Orton fail in his last chance attempt to get the better of Triple H in a battle over the World Heavyweight title, but The Big Show and Kurt Angle would be unable to take the WWE title away from JBL. So it'd be up to whoever won the Rumble to try next then, as whether it be a Raw or SmackDown superstar who came out on top, they'd have the opportunity to choose the champion they wanted to go after at WrestleMania. And while there were a lot of top stars in the match that night, it was clear that there were only two real choices for winner, with these being the two men who were vying for the spot of the next face of the company, Batista and John Cena. But while Big Match John would become the bigger star over time, on that night, the momentum of the animal could not be stopped. 
Well, almost, because in one of the greatest botches in wrestling history, the match would end with the two men being the last remaining and accidentally eliminating each other at the same time, leaving the referees confused and panicking about what they should do next. So with pay-per-view time running out, Vince McMahon himself would come to the ring to restart the match, allowing Big Dave the opportunity to get the win as he was supposed to. The only problem with this was that when the boss did so, he would legitimately blow out both of his quads while climbing into the ring, forcing him to fall to the ground in pain once he tried to get up, then having to sit there angrily in one of the funniest scenes you're ever likely to see in a wrestling ring. That said, by the next night on Raw, most wouldn't even be paying attention to the botched ending anymore, because by now, it was all about who Batista was going to choose to go after at the Showcase of the Immortals. And while the obvious answer was a babyface turn in a feud with Triple H, the crowd were at first teased with the possibility that the animal might go over to SmackDown and challenge JBL instead, allowing Evolution to run both brands simultaneously. By the February 21st episode of Raw, however, any uncertainty would be laid to rest when, after giving his mentor the thumbs down in the same manner he had to Randy Orton the year prior, the animal would unleash himself on Triple H, powerbombing him through a table, and finally completing his babyface turn. Of course, this was a huge relief to JBL because the night prior to this, on February 20th, he'd only just about survived after somehow managing to retain his WWE title against The Big Show in a barbed wire cage match. And that wasn't the only notable moment from this show either, because on the last stop before WrestleMania, John Cena would earn himself a shot at the top prize when he defeated Kurt Angle, Eddie Guerrero and Rey Mysterio would win the WWE Tag Team titles from the Basham Brothers, and The Undertaker would continue a string of poor matches when he beat muscle man jobber Luther Reigns in a convincing fashion. That said, he would get something to sink his teeth into soon enough, because at WrestleMania 21, just over a month later, the streak would finally become a thing when he faced off against the legend killer Randy Orton. Before we would get there, though, the WWE Hall of Fame would take place on April 2nd, and this year, the class would be one of the most stacked ever seen, as entrants included the likes of Hulk Hogan, Rowdy Roddy Piper, and the Iron Sheik. Then the following night, as the legends were celebrating earning their new class rings, the current roster would come together for the biggest show of the year, a show which started off with a bang when now former tag team champions Rey Mysterio and Eddie Guerrero came to blows. But that wasn't the only big bout in the undercard, however, because after this, the first ever Money in the Bank ladder match would take place between Chris Jericho, Chris Benoit, Shelton Benjamin, Kane, Christian, and eventual winner, Edge. And his victory here would mean that for the next 12 months, the former Intercontinental Champion now had an open contract to challenge for either world title at any time of his choosing. But while he would choose to bide his time with this, there would be no such patience for his future partner Randy Orton as, in the following contest, he'd become the first real threat to what was now being marketed as The Undertaker's undefeated WrestleMania streak. That said, while he would come perilously close to winning this one, with him at one point reversing a chokeslam into a heart-stopping RKO nearfall, it would be the dead man who came out the victor by the end, maintaining his legacy for the time being. But even that wasn't the in-ring highlight of the night because, following this, fans were treated to a five-star classic when, for the first time ever, Shawn Michaels and Kurt Angle went one-on-one. -on -one. And after a hard-fought battle here, it would be the Olympic hero who came out on top after forcing HBK to tap out in just over 27 minutes. Then, once the Big Show and sumo wrestler Akibono match took place and slowed things down a little, fans were ready to be brought back up just in time for the two world title matches the first of which saw John Cena take on JBL for the WWE title. Of course, while Big Match John's eventual win here would be more historically significant in hindsight, on the night, it only served as a prelude to the real main event, and that was Triple H versus Batista for the World Heavyweight title. Yes, after over two years of holding Raw hostage with his reign of terror, fans were finally ready to see the game fall and fall he did here in a spectacular fashion as, in a bout which lasted just over 21 minutes, he'd make the animal look like a superstar as he went on to start his first reign as champion. So following this then, it seemed like there was a new dawn starting for WWE, as with two top stars of the future now leading their respective brands, anything seemed possible.
And this would lead us into the next pay-per-view of the year, Backlash, on May 1st, where, in a Raw exclusive show, Batista would once again defeat his former mentor in a rematch from the month before. Elsewhere on the card, meanwhile, other highlights would see the Hurricane and Rosie become the new World Tag Team Champions, Edge defeat Chris Benoit in a fantastic Last Man Standing match, and the brief alliance of Hulk Hogan and Shawn Michaels see the two legends get the better of Muhammad Hassan and Davari. Of course, once this show was over, though, Raw would have to sit the next eight weeks out as, well, they were putting on the hugely underrated Gold Rush tournament, which saw Edge earn himself a World Heavyweight title shot on May 23rd, SmackDown would take over the reins of pay-per-view when they put on Judgment Day the night before this. And on that show, the focus would be further establishing John Cena as he successfully defended his WWE title in the rematch against JBL. This time, though, it would be no normal singles bout. No, it would be an I Quit match instead, with the brutal war which followed here going a long way towards proving that Big Match John had it in him to be the top star the company wanted him to be. Aside from that, however, the rest of the card would be somewhat forgettable, with the only real moments of note being the Eddie Guerrero and Rey Mysterio rematch, which saw the masked star come out on top, and the Booker T-Kurt Angle bout, which led to a victory for the former. So with Big Match John clearly being the draw for the blue brand now, it must have been a devastating blow when, just two weeks later on June 6th, shockwaves would be sent through the company when the champ was moved over to Raw during that year's draft leaving SmackDown without a top title in the process. And as if this wasn't a big enough moment for June, just six days after that, a ghost from the past would return, when as a result of the success of the rise and fall of ECW DVD, Extreme Championship Wrestling was formally revived for their one-night stand show. There then, in one of the greatest WWE-promoted pay-per-views of all time, nostalgia would reign supreme as old favorites like Sabu and Mike Awesome returned to face off against Rhino and Masato Tanaka, respectively, all while elsewhere, now-established WWE guys would turn the clocks back when Lance Storm and Chris Jericho went one-on-one, -on -one, and Chris Benoit and Eddie Guerrero did the same. After that, The Sandman would have one of the best entrances ever when he came out through the crowd to the strain of Metallica's Enter Sandman. That said, it would be the aftermath of his bout which most people were talking about once it was done because, in a post-match brawl, JBL would shoot on the blue meanie and legitimately beat him up. And this incident then would lead to the meanie threatening to sue WWE, with him only being talked down from this when Vince McMahon offered to give him a pinfall win over the Texan on a subsequent episode of SmackDown. Of course, this wasn't the only controversy going on in WWE at that time because only a few months prior, Matt Hardy had been fired after going public about the fact that his real-life girlfriend Lita had been having an affair with Edge. But with fans generally seeing Hardy as the victim in this situation, it meant that Edge and Lita were able to use the now visceral heat fans were throwing at them and take their careers to new heights when they joined forces on screen around June, just in time for vengeance on the 26th of that month. So now an item then, the two would make short work of Lita's former on-screen lover Kane at this show. And once this was done, the rest of the card would see Shawn Michaels and Kurt Angle have their much-anticipated rematch, John Cena successfully defend the WWE title against Chris Jericho and Christian, and Batista beat Triple H for a third time, this time inside Hell in a Cell. That said, when he did so, he didn't realize it was going to represent his Raw Swan song. No, as it turned out, he would be just as surprised as anyone when, four days later, he'd be drafted over to SmackDown, taking the World Heavyweight title with him in the process. And his first big challenge on the blue brand would see him go up against JBL at July 24th's Great American Bash, a match which allowed him to establish himself as the top dog on an all-new show when he came out victorious in just under 20 minutes. Elsewhere on this card, meanwhile, the Eddie Guerrero and Rey Mysterio saga would continue with another match which, if the former won, it would allow him to reveal a dark secret about his foe's past. Then once that was over, The Undertaker would earn yet another pay-per-view victory when he beat Muhammad Hassan. That said, while this marked a big win for the dead man, it would end up being the final pay-per-view appearance of Hassan, because in the weeks prior to this, he'd court controversy when a segment featuring a number of masked men invading the ringside area occurred on the same day as the 7-7 London bombings. And because of the perceived terrorist implications of this angle then, the Blue Brand's TV network, UPN, would demand that Hassan be removed from all weekly TV programming from there on in. 
But this wasn't the only problem WWE were dealing with at the time because over on Raw, despite kids really getting behind John Cena, by now a vocal backlash had grown amongst adult males who didn't like the new more superhero-like direction he'd taken after dropping the Doctor of Thugonomics character. So leading into August 21st SummerSlam then, the hope was that if he was put on the opposite side of the ring from a top heel like Chris Jericho, people would get back on his side. Unfortunately though, despite successfully defending his WWE title against Y2J on this show, the growing dissent over his new character would only continue to grow stronger. Still, at least Batista was faring better as a top babyface, because on that same show, he'd managed to put on another great bout with JBL, racking up another win come the end of this one. Elsewhere, meanwhile, the rest of the card would be spottier, as while well, the highs saw Randy Orton finally get a big-time win over The Undertaker and Chris Benoit defeat Orlando Jordan for the United States title, the lows would see Matt Hardy triumphantly return to WWE only to be jobbed out to Edge in under five minutes, and a good Eddie Guerrero and Rey Mysterio bout be hampered by a ridiculous gimmick. Yes, in the weeks leading up to this show, Eddie had revealed that he was actually the biological father of Rey's son Dominic. And so this bout then would see the two former best friends fight it out over the custody of the child in a ladder match. But even that wasn't the silliest part of this card because in the main event, Shawn Michaels, having no time for Hulk Hogan's backstage politicking, would make the American hero look like an absolute fool during their one and only singles match when he oversold for him in comical fashion at every turn. And this meant that, even if the Hulkster did get the pinfall come the end of this one, it was in such a pantomime fashion that, in fans' eyes, HBK was the real winner. Of course, by the next night on Raw, the Shawn Michaels-Hulk Hogan feud would be over and done with, and instead, the focus would return to getting John Cena over with adult males. So with Chris Jericho taking a hiatus from the company after losing a You're Fired match against the champ on this episode of TV, it would be left to Kurt Angle to take the place of the next top heel in line as a challenger. Sadly though, for as good as Kurt was, even he couldn't get Cena over with adult males, and so when the two had their singles match for the title at September 18th's Unforgiven, the Olympic hero would get more cheers than the babyface. At least he put Big Match John over clean here, giving him further credibility as a fighting champion in the process. And the rest of the card would prove to be pretty successful in terms of match results too, as over the course of its runtime, fans got to see Ric Flair win the Intercontinental title from Carlito, Lance Cade and Trevor Murdoch become World Tag Team Champions after defeating the Hurricane and Rosie, and Matt Hardy finally gets some measure of revenge over Edge when he beat him in a steel cage match. That said, only a few weeks later on Raw, the saga of Matt Hardy and his love rival would reach its true conclusion. And here, it would be the heel that came out the ultimate victor after he was able to beat version 1 in a Loser Leaves Town match. So following this, Hardy would be shipped over to SmackDown where he'd take part in October 9th's No Mercy, a blue brand exclusive which also saw young Bobby Lashley get the better of Simon Dean, Randy Orton and his father Bob score a victory over The Undertaker in a casket match, and Batista get the better of Eddie Guerrero in the World Heavyweight title match. Of course, a rematch was still in the pipeline for the top prize as far as Latino Heat was concerned, and at least initially, plans amongst management had been to have Eddie win the title during this return bout. That would all change soon, however, but before we got there, November 1st would see Raw host Taboo Tuesday, another pay-per-view where the matches were voted on by fans. But while this show would see such highlights as the return of Triple H after a hiatus following his third loss to Batista, a pretty good triple threat main event between John Cena, Kurt Angle, and Shawn Michaels, and the almost return of Steve Austin to the ring before he pulled out of his match with Jonathan Coachman at the last minute, it would be largely forgotten by fans come November 13th, as on this day, tragedy would strike. Yes, after having suffered a massive heart attack earlier that morning, Eddie Guerrero would be found dying on his hotel room floor by his nephew Chavo. And despite his attempts to save him then, once Eddie reached the hospital soon thereafter, he'd be pronounced dead on arrival. So as a tribute to their fallen friend, WWE would host special tribute shows to Latino Heat in place of Raw and SmackDown the following week, allowing everyone a chance to grieve. That said, they couldn't grieve for long because by November 27th, it was full steam ahead for Survivor Series, a show which saw Triple H, by now having shown his true colors after turning on his last Evolution stablemate, go one-on-one -on -one with Ric Flair in a Last Man Standing match. On top of that, Chris Benoit and Booker T would start off their very memorable Best of Seven series, 
John Cena would have another great title defense against Kurt Angle despite fans' continued protests. Trish Stratus would rack up yet another win when she defended her women's title against Melina. And Randy Orton would stand victorious for Team SmackDown in the 5-on-5 elimination match main event, pitting both brands against one another. Of course, after he won, The Undertaker would return to once again set his sights on him. And after another brief stop over to Afghanistan for a tribute to the troops show on December 9th, this would lead us to the final pay-per-view of the year, Armageddon, just nine days later. A show where, in another blue brand exclusive, the Deadman and the Viper would settle things once and for all inside of Hell in a Cell. Elsewhere on the card, meanwhile, things would be less dangerous as a fairly weak show was filled out with another Chris Benoit Booker T match in their series, Bobby Lashley's continued rise with a win over William Regal, and The Big Show and Kane teaming up to defeat Batista and Rey Mysterio in a tag bout. But while it would have been a shame things ended on such a limp note with Armageddon, at least it wasn't representative of the whole year, as over the course of 2005, WWE had done so much to set the table for the future to come. And that's because, during this period, they managed to create two new legitimate main eventers, one of which would go on to be the franchise player for many years to come. That said, they would still have to deal with the nagging problem of Cena getting booed by the majority of fans going forward, something they would continue to work hard at as 2006 took hold. But that's a story for another day, and with there being nothing left to tell for WWE in 2005, we'll have to wait for the next one to come around. And believe us, you don't want to miss this one, because 2006 starts with a bang, a rated R one. 2006 was a huge year in pop culture. In the world of film, Martin Scorsese brought us The Departed. In music, Gnarls Barkley was topping the charts with their hit single Crazy, and meanwhile in the world of wrestling, the ruthless aggression era would continue, with John Cena at the top of the card, all while at the same time, a new rated R main eventer was about to make his presence felt too. But how did it all happen? Well, join us today as we take a deep dive into the entire story from start to finish in the WWE in 2006, A Year in Review. And this one would start with a bang, because at the first show of the year on January 8th, New Year's Revolution, after a mostly forgettable card which saw Triple H defeat the Big Show and Trish Stratus get the better of Mickie James, the main event would feature the return of the Elimination Chamber. Of course, this would put WWE Champion John Cena at a distinct disadvantage then, because here he'd have to defend his title against five other men, with those challengers being made up of Shawn Michaels, Kurt Angle, Kane, Carlito, and Chris Masters. That said, by the end of the bout, he'd have come out on top. The only problem with this was that, while he was laying there beaten and bloodied in the ring, Vince McMahon would come out to announce that right then, Edge was cashing in his Money in the Bank contract and was challenging the champ one-on-one. -on -one. So with Big Match John barely able to stand at this point, what happened next was inevitable. And after just one minute and 46 seconds then, this would come to pass as the ultimate opportunist celebrated in the ring with Lita as the new WWE Champion. But this wasn't the only big world title change going on at this point, because meanwhile over on SmackDown, a tricep injury would see Batista have to vacate his championship. And this meant that on the January 13th episode of SmackDown, a 20-man battle royal would take place in order to crown a new top dog on the blue brand, with the winner of this ultimately being Kurt Angle. So this led us into the next big show of the year then, the Royal Rumble on January 29th, as there, while Angle was defending his newly won belt against Mark Henry, John Cena would get his rematch with Edge. But while Angle would successfully defend his gold, in that latter bout, another title change would actually take place, as after tapping out the rated R superstar in just over 15 minutes, Cena would once again be the champ. Elsewhere on the card, meanwhile, Gregory Helms would win the Cruiserweight title from Kid Cash, Mickie James would score a victory over Ashley Massaro, and in the Rumble itself, Rey Mysterio would do it for Eddie Guerrero when, after drawing the short straw and entering at number two, he'd go the distance and win the entire thing. So this then meant he'd be the number one contender for either the WWE title or the World Heavyweight title at WrestleMania, a decision he'd have to think long and hard about over the weeks which followed. And when he eventually settled on challenging Kurt Angle, it meant a new challenger would have to be determined for Big Match John at the Showcase of the Immortals too. So in order to find one then, an eight-man tournament would be held over on the red brand over the next few weeks, with the winner of this ending up being Triple H. 
Meanwhile, though, as Raw was doing this, SmackDown would be returning to pay-per-view on February 19th, as it was then that they would host No Way Out. And this show would be a pretty eventful one as it happened, because not only did it feature another entry in the ongoing Best of Seven series between Booker T and Chris Benoit, but it would also see Kurt Angle defend the World Heavyweight title against The Undertaker. Of course, proving he really was as good as he said he was here, the Olympic hero would be able to score a pinfall over the dead man during this one, ensuring he'd be walking into the biggest show of the year as the champion. That said, his challenger would be less clear after the night was over, because elsewhere on the card, Randy Orton would challenge Rey Mysterio for his WrestleMania title shot, with the legend killer actually managing to get the win here, and seemingly freezing Rey out of the title scene at the last minute. Luckily then, as a result of the screwy way the heel had picked up the victory at No Way Out, SmackDown General Manager Teddy Long would come out to the ring on the following episode of The Blue Brand to announce it would now be a triple threat match for the World Heavyweight title at the big show, with Mysterio once again being included in this. Before we could get there though, the Road to WrestleMania tour would see the company take a trip over to New Zealand on March 4th, where the local fans got to see many of the big stars in action. Then once these performers had returned stateside, it would be time for the annual Hall of Fame, as this year on April 1st, big time names such as Bret Hart, Mean Gene Okerlund, and of course, Eddie Guerrero would be inducted. Following that, the very next night, WrestleMania 22 would finally take place, with this one quite literally starting off big when Kane and The Big Show successfully defended their World Tag Team titles against Carlito and Chris Masters. And things would only get better from here too, as after this, the second annual Money in the Bank ladder match would take place and would feature Bobby Lashley, Shelton Benjamin, Ric Flair, Matt Hardy, Finley, and eventual winner, Rob Van Dam. So, with RVD now having a title shot to cash in at a time of his choosing, he'd be watching carefully as the two world title matches took place later that evening. Before we get there though, Mickie James would beat Trish Stratus for the women's title in one of the best women's bouts WWE had ever seen at the time. Edge would give Mick Foley his WrestleMania moment when, during their insane hardcore match, he'd spear him through a flaming table, and The Undertaker would take his streak to 14-0 when he defeated Mark Henry in a casket match. But even those bouts didn't represent the high watermark of the show, because following these, Shawn Michaels would go one-on-one -on -one with Vince McMahon himself in a bout which saw the two absolutely brutalize each other, and at one point, HBK even drop a crotch chop. And that wouldn't be the only DX reference of the night either, because during Triple H's WWE title bout with John Cena, he'd hit a crotch chop of his own, something which didn't exactly help in making him a heel to the crowd, who were vocally against the champ. That said, this didn't stop Big Match John from coming out the winner by the end though, as following the victory, he'd continue on with his reign. But if fans were unhappy with this, they'd at least gotten to witness the emotional highlight of the night not long before this, when Rey Mysterio did Eddie proud by beating both Kurt Angle and Randy Orton to become the World Heavyweight Champion. It's just unfortunate then that as a result of Vince McMahon never fully getting behind Ray on account of his size, the title reign which followed would be notorious for being one of the worst booked ever, with the champ often being jobbed out in non-title matches. But at least he didn't have to worry about that happening on pay-per-view quite yet, because on April 30th, it would be Raw that got the next big show as they hosted Backlash. And this one would perhaps be most memorable for it seeing the Shawn Michaels Vince McMahon feud continue when the boss and his son Shane literally took on HBK and God in a tag team match. Yes, forget Logan Paul or Bad Bunny, because 2006 saw the biggest celebrity crossover ever when the Almighty themselves, represented here by a spotlight, would partner up with the then born again Michaels in one of the most ridiculous moments in WWE history. Elsewhere though, things would be a lot more serious as Umaga would make his pay-per-view debut by destroying Ric Flair, all before Trish Stratus was forced to get mean in order to regain her women's title from Mickey James. Then once that was done, Kane and the Big Show would come to blows in a bout which ultimately ended in a no contest, and Money in the Bank contract holder Rob Van Dam would briefly become Intercontinental Champion when he defeated Shelton Benjamin for the honor. That said, when it came to the WWE title, this would stay around the waist of John Cena once more, as in the main event, he was able to fend off both Triple H and Edge in order to retain. Of course, after the bout, it would technically be the game who was standing tall, as once he hit the champ with a pedigree, he'd drop more DX hints by closing things out with yet another crotch chop. 
And all these teases would eventually lead to the May 22nd episode of Raw, where, while Shawn Michaels was being outnumbered by the McMahons and their new lackeys, the Spirit Squad, Triple H would hit the ring to help his old friend out, formally reuniting the old stable from there. And Raw would need a big moment like this to get the focus back on them because the night prior, SmackDown had gone back to pay-per-view for Judgment Day, a show which saw Brian Kendrick and Paul London become WWE Tag Team Champions after beating Eminem, The Undertaker regressed to the 90s when he was forced to try and get a good match out of the Great Khali, and Rey Mysterio eke out a successful World Heavyweight title defense over JBL. Of course, that wasn't the most memorable thing which came out of this show, however, as earlier in the night, Booker T had defeated Bobby Lashley to become King of the Ring, an honor which would see him from there morph into King Booker, a character which represented a high point for his WWE career. What was the reason for this? Well, he was frequently able to play up the comedy of it all by adopting a ridiculous English accent and creating a court around himself with the likes of William Regal, Finley, and Queen Charmel. So yes, things were looking bright for both Raw and SmackDown at this point. That said, they would soon find themselves with some new competition for fans' attention as, following the success of the prior year's One Night Stand pay-per-view, WWE announced they were not only doing a second one, but afterwards, they'd be fully reviving ECW as its own brand with its own separate weekly show. And in order to start things off with a bang then, at One Night Stand Round 2, Rob Van Dam announced ahead of time that he would be cashing in his Money in the Bank contract on John Cena. Before we get there though, fans would get a teaser of what was to come, when on June 7th, WWE vs ECW Head to Head would take place and would feature the likes of Edge vs Tommy Dreamer and John Cena vs Sabu. Then, four days later, the big show itself would happen at the Hammerstein Ballroom in front of a loyal hardcore crowd who were so rabid, it ended up creating one of the best atmospheres ever seen at a WWE-produced show. And this would only serve to make things even more heated than when Rey Mysterio and Sabu went to a no contest over the World Heavyweight title, and Mick Foley went heel and joined forces with his old foes Edge and Lita to defeat Terry Funk, Tommy Dreamer, and Beulah McGillicuddy in six-person tag team action. Of course, this was only table setting for the main event, however, as entering full enemy territory that night, John Cena would come out to the ring for the final match against a crowd so hostile, one now iconic fan sign even read, if Cena wins, we riot. Luckily then, Cena would not win here, because after a well-timed interference spot from Edge at the close of the bout, Rob Van Dam would be able to get the pin to become the new WWE Champion. And as a result of this, on the debut episode of ECW TV just two days later, Paul Heyman would also crown RVD the ECW World Champion as well, making him a double title holder from there. So that would lead into the next big show of the year on June 26th, Vengeance, where despite this being a Raw exclusive show, ECW would be represented when RVD successfully defended the WWE title against Edge. But that wouldn't be the only notable moment of this show, because elsewhere, Umaga would continue his rise by making short work of Eugene, Johnny Nitro would become Intercontinental Champion after beating Shelton Benjamin and Carlito in a triple threat bout, and John Cena and Sabu would go one-on-one -on -one again in an Extreme Rules Lumberjack match. Then, in the actual main event of the night, the DX reunion would take to the ring when Triple H and Shawn Michaels defeated the Spirit Squad in a 5-on-2 handicap match. Of course, for as fun as it was to see the Degenerates back together, it had become clear by then that as a result of HBK having found God and both men now being in their 40s, this was not the same rebel group it had once been during the late 90s. No, this time Degeneration X were far more PG in nature, something which upset many older fans, but which entertained the kids nonetheless. But coming out of Vengeance, WWE had bigger problems to deal with than a section of the fanbase being unhappy with the new direction of Triple H and Shawn Michaels, because after getting busted for smoking weed in his car while traveling to a show with Sabu, Rob Van Dam would be suspended and stripped of both his WWE and ECW world titles. And this meant that, while on the red brand side, Edge would once again become champ after pinning RVD in an impromptu match on the following episode of Raw. On the ECW side, a new champ would quickly have to be crowned in the form of the Big Show. Needless to say then, the decision to have the once renegade promotion be led by Paul White didn't go down well with fans, as this would prove to be symbolic of Paul Heyman's worst fears about the revival, that it would just turn into another watered-down WWE product with none of the extreme identity it once had. 
Still, even if Heyman was listening to fan complaints and agreed with many of them, it was Vince McMahon who was booking the show now, and so, as the weeks went on, ECW would sink further and further into irrelevancy as it basically turned into a trumped-up version of Heat or Velocity. But while the legendary Philly promotion was collapsing fast, at least SmackDown was still going strong, as on July 23rd they'd return to pay-per-view when they put on the Great American Bash, a show which saw Finley and William Regal revive their old feud from WCW, Mr. Kennedy get an early moment to shine when he got a big-time win over a recently returned Batista, and Rey Mysterio's world title run mercifully come to an end when following a heel turn from Chavo Guerrero, King Booka would pin the champ to win the top prize for himself. And that would all lead us to the biggest show of the summer, as a month later on August 20th, SummerSlam would take place and would see all three world titles on the line as the big show successfully defended the ECW strap against Sabu, Edge was able to get one over on John Cena to retain the top prize on Raw, and Batista score a disqualification victory over world heavyweight champion King Booker. Elsewhere, meanwhile, the Chavo Guerrero Rey Mysterio feud would continue with Chavo picking up the initial win, Degeneration X would defeat the McMahons in a tag team match, and Hulk Hogan would return to have his last WWE bout to date when he scored a pinfall victory over Randy Orton. Not that this would worry the legend killer for too long, however, because the very next month at September 17th's Unforgiven, he'd bounce back by scoring a victory over Carlito. But this wouldn't be the most notable moment of that show either, because aside from Jeff Hardy making his return to pay-per-view following a spell in TNA, DX beating the McMahons in the Big Show in a Hell in a Cell match, and John Cena regaining the top prize on Raw when he was able to get the better of Edge in a TLC bout, Trish Stratus would retire after beating Lita for the women's title in her final farewell. Yes, after proving so many people wrong about what she was capable of in the ring, Trish had decided to move on to new ventures in her life, feeling like she'd given WWE fans more than enough stratisfaction during her time there. That said, these changing times would not be matched over on SmackDown, because when they returned to pay-per-view on October 8th for No Mercy, the status quo would largely be maintained when Brian Kendrick and Paul London retained their World Tag Team titles in a match against Casey James and Idol Stevens, and King Booker got the better of Bobby Lashley, Batista, and Finley to keep hold of the World Heavyweight title. Not that nothing changed during this show, however, as after Vicky Guerrero had also turned on Rey Mysterio during the weeks leading up to the show, the now former World Heavyweight Champion was able to get some measure of revenge on Chavo Guerrero when he pinned him in a Falls Count Anywhere match. And if that wasn't enough, once this was over, the rise of Mr. Kennedy would continue too when he was able to defeat The Undertaker via disqualification. But while the after-effects of this big win would continue to percolate on SmackDown, it would be up to Raw to take the reins next, as on November 5th, they'd host Cyber Sunday, another show which saw matches be voted on by the fans ahead of time. And this would lead to some interesting situations then, such as the newly formed rated RKO, made up as they were of Randy Orton and Edge, getting one over on DX. Lita defeating Mickey James to win the then-vacant women's title, and Ric Flair and Rowdy Roddy Piper turning back the clocks when they briefly became the tag team champions after beating the Spirit Squad. Then in the main event, the world champions of all three brands would clash for the first time, with King Booker proving to be the better man here after former husband of Britney Spears, Kevin Federline, got involved and cost Big Match John the win. So in the weeks following this, Federline and Cena would actually go one-on-one -on, -one on Raw, with the rapper even getting the shock victory after Umaga interfered and staked his claim to the WWE title. And that would lead us into the Survivor Series on November 26th, as there, Cena and Umaga would be on opposite sides of the ring from each other during one of the two 5-on-5 five -five elimination matches. Of course, the second of these would be much more notable in the long run, as it saw CM Punk, someone who had not long before joined the ECW roster, end up being the most over man in the match, forcing DX to even get on the mic and acknowledge this after the fact. But this wouldn't be all that was happening here, as in what turned out to be her retirement bout as well, Lita would lose the women's title to Mickie James. Then, once that was done, not only would Mr. Kennedy defeat The Undertaker in a first blood match, but Batista would finally dethrone King Booker to regain the world title he never actually lost. That said, for as big of a month as this had turned out to be for Raw and SmackDown, the following month would prove to be disastrous for the third brand, because after ECW's December to Dismember on December 3rd, Paul Heyman would end up out of the company after being the fall guy for arguably the worst WWE-produced show in history. Why was this one so bad? 
Well, it was ECW as booked by Vince McMahon, and so this meant that instead of having the Red Hot CM Punk win the world title during the Extreme Elimination Chamber main event, the boss would fall back on his old ways by having Bobby Lashley come out the victor instead and stand as the absolute antithesis of everything the brand had once stood for. Still, at least the show had given fans a chance to see the Hardy Boys reunite to take on Eminem, so it wasn't all bad. That said, this was only a very mild positive, and so, hoping to swiftly move on from the whole thing then, the company would instead start focusing on their final big show of the year on December 17th, Armageddon, after it was done. And this one proved to be notable because it would be all about both beginnings and endings, as well Chris Benoit was getting his own revenge on Chavo Guerrero for the way the cruiserweight had disrespected his family's name, Kane would put his SmackDown feud with MVP to bed when he set him alight during an Inferno match. Then once that was over, The Miz would make an early pay-per-view appearance with a loss to the Boogeyman, The Undertaker would close out his program with Mr. Kennedy when he beat him in a last ride bout, and in the main event, world champions John Cena and Batista would team up to take on King Booka and Finley in a tag team match. But Big Match John couldn't relax after winning this one because he still had Umaga in his rearview mirror to worry about. That said, this eventual showdown wouldn't come about until the following year, as after one more trip to Iraq for a tribute to the troops show, this would mark the end of 2006 for the WWE. And while it had been a year of ups and downs, it certainly proved that no matter what, the company was here to stay for the foreseeable future, even if the boom period was now a thing of the distant past. Of course, this security would be tested to its limits the following year though, because it was in 2007 that arguably the darkest moment in the company's history briefly threatened to sink the entire industry. But we'll get there soon enough. 2007 was a huge year in pop culture. In the world of television, we would see not only the end of The Sopranos, but also the beginning of Mad Men. In film, we'd see Mickey Rourke take on the starring role in The Wrestler. And meanwhile, in the WWE, we'd have one of the most memorable years in company history. However, not all for good reason. But how did it all happen? Well, join us today as we take a deep dive into the entire story from start to finish in WWE in 2007, A Year in Review. When we last left off, Batista was standing tall once more as SmackDown's top dog, ECW was dying fast, and John Cena was riding high as WWE Champion, even if he was facing a growing wave of fan backlash. But fans were the least of his worries heading into the first pay-per-view of the year, New Year's Revolution, on January 7th, because there, he'd have to contend with the man who'd spent the last few months of 2006 making his life a living hell, and that was Umaga. Before their bout took place though, Jeff Hardy and Johnny Nitro would settle their ongoing beef over the Intercontinental title inside of a steel cage, Mickey James would take her spot as the reigning queen of the women's division when she beat Victoria, and Rated RKO and DX would go to a no contest in a brutal battle over the world tag team belts. Then once all that was done, the final Raw exclusive pay-per-view of the era would see Big Match John finally prove some of his doubters wrong when he had a pretty great match with Umaga, which eventually saw him come out the victor. Not that this would be the end of the feud, however, because with the Samoan still feeling like he could dethrone the champ if he had one more shot, a rematch would be booked for the Royal Rumble later that month on January 28th. Of course, that wouldn't be the only world title program on this show, however, because on the SmackDown side of things, the meteoric rise of Mr. Kennedy would continue with him finally getting a shot at Batista. That said, despite the heel's best efforts here, it would be the champ who came out the victor, and the same could be said for the Cena-Umaga rematch too as it happened. But at least Umaga now had the feather in the cap of being able to say that, during his last man standing bout with Big Match John, he'd helped him put on probably his best singles bout to date, as over the course of a bloody and brutal 23 minutes, they'd pretty much steal the show. And this is even more impressive because they had such strong competition that night. Competition which included the Hardys and Eminem going at it in a tag team match, Bobby Lashley successfully defending his ECW world title against Test, and the Royal Rumble itself where, for the first time ever, the number 30 entrant would get the win when The Undertaker got the luck of the draw and used it to his advantage. 
Of course, he almost wasn't able to do so, though, because the last few minutes of this one would see the dead man have to contend with Shawn Michaels, as the two had a bit of a mini-match which marked their first on-screen interaction since 1998. And the fact that HBK would end up getting eliminated by his old rival here stung all the more, because in the weeks prior, his tag partner Triple H had been taken out with a quad tear, meaning he was going to miss the next seven months of action. So with the plan originally having been for him to have a rematch from the year prior with John Cena at WrestleMania 23, it meant that things would have to be rewritten at the last minute. That said, the company still had some time to figure out what they were going to do, because before the showcase of the Immortals, the final SmackDown exclusive show of the era would come on February 18th when No Way Out was held. And here, the rise of Mr. Kennedy would continue when he was able to score a DQ victory over reigning ECW champion Bobby Lashley. But that wasn't all that was going on during this one though, because elsewhere on the card, Chavo Guerrero would regain the Cruiserweight title during a Cruiserweight Open match, Paul London and Brian Kendrick would successfully defend the WWE Tag Team titles against Deuce and Domino, and the two WrestleMania World title programs would be set up when Batista and The Undertaker teamed up to take on John Cena and Shawn Michaels. Yes, in the wake of the Phenom choosing to go after the World Heavyweight title at the Big Show, HBK had been selected as the man to replace the game on the Raw side. And what a choice this turned out to be, because the match he went on to have with Cena at Mania would prove to be another career best for the champ. Before we'd get there though, the WWE Hall of Fame would take place on March 31st and would see another all-star class be inducted. Then, once that was done, the following night, WrestleMania 23 would take place in front of a sold-out Detroit crowd. And aside from the two big-time main events, what made this one even more notable was the fact that, in the now infamous Battle of the Billionaires, with Steve Austin acting as the special guest referee, Vince McMahon and Donald Trump would both choose surrogates to take on each other, with these surrogates ending up being Umaga on the McMahon side and Bobby Lashley on the Trump side. And not only did this mark a huge career highlight for both wrestlers then, it also helped to push the show over the top financially and make it the highest grossing pay-per-view WWE had ever done at the time. But it wasn't only the Battle of the Billionaires which made this one so memorable. No, elsewhere the rest of the card was stacked out with great bout after great bout, bouts which included the likes of the Money in the Bank ladder match where Mr. Kennedy would win the whole thing so as to earn himself a world title shot at a time of his choosing. So needless to say then, he was watching both main events carefully, as in the first one, The Undertaker's run of classic streak matches would begin when he had put on a 5-star showing with Batista and took things to 15-0 in the process. Then after that, John Cena and Shawn Michaels would have arguably an even better contest when over the course of almost 30 minutes, HBK did everything he could to make Big Match John look like a killer. But no matter how hard he tried, Michaels just couldn't manage to get the adult male fans behind the reigning champion. So hoping another round might solve the problem then, he'd take on Cena in a rematch on the April 23rd episode of Raw, with this one going for a full hour and still standing today as one of the greatest bouts WWE has ever given away on free TV. That said, for a certain section of the audience, John's performance on that night still wasn't enough and neither was his impressive showing at Judgment Day the following Sunday, where he once again successfully defended his title, this time against HBK, Edge, and Randy Orton in a fatal four-way match. But it wasn't just the Raw main event scene which was being represented on this show, because with WWE deciding to scrap the idea of doing brand-specific pay-per-views following WrestleMania, fans would also get to see Batista and The Undertaker have their much-anticipated rematch here too. Of course, unlike Mania where the dead man had picked up the clean win, this time things would end far less definitively as after both men failed to answer a 10 count, the bout was thrown out and declared a draw. But as disappointing as this was for the audience in attendance, at least they'd gotten to see a world title change earlier on in the evening, because after being forced to defend his ECW title in a 3 on 1 handicap match against Umaga, Vince McMahon and Shane McMahon, the Almighty would end up getting pinned by none other than the boss himself. Yes, if the once extreme Philly promotion wasn't already dead and buried before this, the sight of Vince McMahon coming out to the ring the next week with a do-rag on his head and the ECW belt around his waist just about made fans who remembered what the promotion had once been vomit in their mouths. And sure, it would lead to Lashley getting a rematch at the next pay-per-view of the year, Judgment Day, 
but by then, the damage had already been done. Before we'd even get to Judgment Day, however, the company would find themselves having to deal with even more bad news when Mr. Kennedy suffered what was, at the time, believed to be a pretty serious tricep injury. Plans had to be changed at the last minute, and Kennedy would instead drop the briefcase to Edge during an impromptu match on the May 7th episode of Raw. And now holding the same prize he had the year before then, the ultimate opportunist would make it a double when just four days later on SmackDown, he'd cash in on The Undertaker after the champ had just survived a grueling steel cage bout with Batista, with Edge using the dead man's weakened state here to make short work of him and become the World Heavyweight Champion once again. Of course, this would then lead us directly into Judgment Day on May 20th, where in his first big title defense, the Rated R Superstar would go to war with Batista. Elsewhere, meanwhile, Randy Orton would defeat Shawn Michaels by means of technical knockout after giving him a kayfabe concussion. CM Punk would get his first big singles win on pay-per-view when he made short work of Elijah Burke. John Cena would be forced to try and get a good showing out of the Great Khali, and Bobby Lashley would fail to win back the ECW world title despite pinning Shane McMahon in another three-on-one handicap match. Why had he not won the belt here? Well, he hadn't pinned the champion. So in order to settle things once and for all then, a final one-on-one -on -one meeting between the boss and the Almighty would be booked for June 3rd's One Night Stand, where after just over 12 minutes, Lashley got the win and his title back. That said, even if this bout was a focused upon one, by now One Night Stand was less of an ECW exclusive show and more of a regular WWE branded one. And so, that was why the rest of the card would be largely filled out with Raw and SmackDown matches, the most notable of which saw the Hardys defeat the world's greatest tag team for the world tag team titles, and Edge retain the world heavyweight title in a steel cage bout against Batista. So after not only the failure of the show, but also his inability to keep the ECW title around his waist, on the June 11th episode of Raw, a new storyline began which saw Vince McMahon's limo explode with him inside it with this supposedly killing him off for good as an on-screen character. As we all know now though, this whole angle, and the murder mystery which followed, would soon have to be scrapped abruptly. Before we get to the reasons behind this, however, June 24th would see Vengeance Night of Champions take place, where, in a pretty meh B-show, Edge would once again successfully defend his World Heavyweight title against Batista, and John Cena would manage to stand tall despite going up against four opponents in the form of Bobby Lashley, King Booker, Randy Orton, and Mick Foley. Of course, this was also the night that the CM Punk Chris Benoit showdown over the vacant ECW title was planned to go ahead. However, Benoit would no-show the event, leading to Johnny Nitro having to sub in for him at the last minute and win the belt in his place. And while at the time people within WWE were concerned about why the usually punctual Benoit would miss the show, it was hoped there was a reasonable explanation to the entire thing. Tragically, however, the very next day, the bodies of not only Benoit, but of his wife Nancy and son Daniel too would be discovered dead at their home in Fayetteville, Georgia. Yes, we had to get here eventually, so let's get it over and done with. Over the weekend prior, Benoit had killed both Nancy and Daniel, all before then taking his own life too. And following this then, for WWE, the subsequent fallout would be nuclear. That's right, every media source in the world were now following the story. Hell, so bad would it get that at moments, it felt like this could be the thing which sunk the entire industry, as it was the worst case of negative public perception pro wrestling had gone through. So needing to clean up their act then, WWE would immediately ban the use of chair shots to the head, all while implementing a new concussion policy and beginning the process of moving their program in a more PG direction. On top of that, as a result of what had happened, the planned Vince McMahon funeral, which was supposed to air on the following episode of Raw, would be scrapped, as instead Vince appeared live in the ring and addressed the whole issue, with this being the last time Benoit's name would ever be uttered on WWE TV. So following this then, Vince did what he always did and pushed on with the show, as on June 22nd, the Great American Bash would take place. And while not a particularly memorable show, this one would at least give us the bizarre pair-ups of Randy Orton vs. Dusty Rhodes and Carlito vs. The Sandman. 
Then after that, John Cena would rack up yet another successful title defense when he got the better of Bobby Lashley, all before the great Khali's first world heavyweight title defense took place against Batista and Kane. Yes, lost in all this madness was the fact that after Edge had fallen to a pectoral injury and been forced to vacate the top prize on SmackDown, Kali would win a battle royal on the July 20th episode of the show to start his first reign on top. That said, his ability to get over with fans outside of his native India meant that this run would be nearing its end by the time the summer came to a close, as at August 26th SummerSlam, he'd fall to Batista by disqualification. Elsewhere on the show, meanwhile, both the WWE title and the ECW title would stay around the waists of John Cena and John Morrison in more definitive fashion when they got the better of their opponents, Randy Orton and CM Punk, respectively. But aside from the in-ring return of Triple H, too, when he took on and defeated King Booker, these would really mark the only notable moments of what was, by the company's usual standards, a pretty weak SummerSlam overall. And things wouldn't be much better on the weekly shows either then, as on the September 10th episode of Raw, one of the sillier angles in recent memory would take place when it was revealed that the secret illegitimate son of Vince McMahon was none other than Hornswoggle. Of course, it wasn't always meant to be this way. No, it was meant to be Mr. Kennedy who filled the role here, but with him returning to action only to then get suspended after failing a drug test, plans would have to be changed and his push would be killed stone dead as a result. Still, there was always the hope that the next pay-per-view would see an upswing for WWE, as on September 16th, they'd put on Unforgiven. Unfortunately, though, this would also end up being a fairly limp effort, as aside from Batista finally dethroning the great Kali and Randy Orton getting a DQ win over John Cena, nothing much of note would happen. Of course, it wasn't as if there was nothing worth watching in the company at all at this point, because only a few weeks prior, CM Punk had finally climbed the next rung on the ladder to success when he defeated John Morrison to become ECW World Champion. But even this would come with a price because while a new champion was being crowned over on the Extreme brand, yet another had to vacate as a result of injury when John Cena tore his pectoral muscle and was forced to relinquish the belt he'd by that point held on to for 380 days. So, needing to announce a new champ quickly then, Vince McMahon would come down to the ring at the beginning of October 7th No Mercy and award the strap to the number one contender, Randy Orton. That said, one person who took umbrage with this was Triple H, as feeling like he deserved to be the champion instead, he'd immediately challenge the Viper to a match. And in a shock to everyone, he'd actually go on to win this one and start his own sixth reign with that particular belt. But even this wouldn't be the end of the night for the WWE title yet, because after being forced to then defend against Umaga later that evening, the game would survive just enough to then have his bones picked by Randy Orton once more. Yes, in what turned out to be the third WWE title match on the show, Orton and Triple H would go once again here, and with the game being so beaten down by this point, there was no chance he was going to be able to overcome the odds anymore. But at least the other world champions were able to retain their gold at this show because, in the undercard prior to this, CM Punk would continue his rise with a win over The Miz, and Batista would overcome the Great Kali inside of the dreaded Punjabi prison. Of course, the reason that the animal and the best in the world had been able to do so was because they had the necessary preparation time for their big bouts. When it came to the next pay-per-view of the year, however, Cyber Sunday on October 28th, they would not have such a luxury, as just like in years prior, the matches here would be voted on by fans. And that led to some interesting bouts on the undercard then, such as Punk defending his world title against The Miz, Triple H and Umaga going at it again in a street fight, and Shawn Michaels getting a shot at revenge against Randy Orton, with the WWE title this time being on the line. Then, as if those weren't big-time enough contests, the main event would see Batista and The Undertaker continue their series, with the added caveat on that night being that Stone Cold Steve Austin would serve as the special guest referee. Yes, despite being well into retirement by now, Austin was still able to make a couple of appearances in 2007, but even he couldn't put the beef towards the champ and the dead man to bed, because once it was over and Batista was standing tall, his opponent would demand one more rematch for November 18th's Survivor Series. And this time it would be held inside of the challenger's own backyard, as it would take place inside the confines of Hell in a Cell. So realizing this represented the greatest threat to his title reign, the animal would quickly get to work on preparing himself for what was to come. 
Before that match would take place though, the undercard would see CM Punk successfully defend his ECW world title against both The Miz and John Morrison, Randy Orton get the better of Shawn Michaels once again, and Cody Rhodes make an early pay-per-view appearance when he teamed with Hardcore Holly to challenge Lance Cade and Trevor Murdoch for the World Tag Team titles. Then after that, Batista would retain his title against The Undertaker, all with a little help from a returning Edge, of course. Not that Edge had any kind of allegiance with the animal, though. No, he just simply wanted to be the one to take the belt from the man himself. And this would lead us into the last pay-per-view of the year, Armageddon, on December 16th then, as there, Batista, Edge, and The Undertaker would go at it in a triple threat match for the World Heavyweight title. Of course, this match and Edge's subsequent win during it to regain his lost gold would not be the only thing people were talking about most when this show was over, because aside from it also featuring Jeff Hardy getting a surprise win over Triple H, it would also mark the return of Chris Jericho to competition for the first time in two years. Yes, after weeks of cryptic Save Us.222 messages airing on WWE TV, the whole thing would finally climax with Y2J making his re-debut on the November 19th episode of Raw, and from there immediately setting his sights on WWE Champion Randy Orton. So when the two finally went at it in the ring on this night, expectations were high that, now fully reinvigorated after his time away, Jericho would be able to become a two-time champion by the end of things. Unfortunately for him though, while he would end up winning this one, it would only be by disqualification, and so as a result, the title would not change hands. But even if he hadn't been successful in taking home the gold, he'd still made a big bang upon his return and re-established himself as a main event player to watch heading into 2008. Because another tribute to the troop show in Iraq aside, this would mark the end of the year for WWE. And while there are large parts of it they probably wish they could forget, at least it closed out with some excitement, as with Edge now standing tall as World Heavyweight Champion and some more big returns being imminent, 2008 was setting up to be a much better year for the company after going through such a tumultuous 12-month period. 2008 was a huge year in pop culture. In television, we would see the first season of Breaking Bad. In film, The Dark Knight hit theaters, and meanwhile, in the WWE, things would continue to move forward in a PG direction, with a brand new top star being crowned. But how did it all happen? Well, join us today as we take a deep dive into the entire story from start to finish in WWE in 2008, A Year in Review. When we last left off, Randy Orton had become the WWE Champion after John Cena fell to injury over on Raw. Edge had just regained the World Heavyweight title on SmackDown, and ECW was on its dying embers. And nowhere was this more evident than on the January 22nd episode of the Extreme Brands TV show, when Chavo Guerrero pinned CM Punk to win their world title, causing the belt to become a shared one between ECW and SmackDown in the process. Of course, that would all lead us into the first big pay-per-view of the year, the Royal Rumble, just five days later, as there, both Guerrero and Punk would enter the titular bout itself. Not that either of them were the focus, however, and because at least early on, it would be all about the two men who had ended things the year prior. That's right, after having a mini-match to close out the Rumble in 2007, The Undertaker and Shawn Michaels entered at numbers one and two respectively, with this continuing on the tease of their eventual showdown. But that wasn't what people were talking about come the close of the match though, as despite the clear favorites to win being Triple H or Batista, everyone would be shocked when John Cena came out at number 30 to pick up the victory by last eliminating the game. And what made this even more shocking was that Big Match John wasn't scheduled to return from injury for months yet. That said, with him seemingly having the healing powers of Wolverine, he was able to speed up this schedule and hit the ring far quicker than anyone had anticipated. But there were other notable moments on this show too, with the biggest of these being Edge and Randy Orton's successful defenses of their world titles over Rey Mysterio and Jeff Hardy respectively. Of course, if the champs thought they still had a couple of months to prepare for Cena yet, they'd both be surprised when, the next night on Raw, the face of the company challenged the Viper to a match for his belt at the following month's No Way Out instead. And that wasn't the only big storyline playing out on the red brand then, because elsewhere, Raw General Manager William Regal was pitting Ric Flair against a new challenger every week, with the stipulation to each of these bouts being that the next time he lost, he'd have to retire. Luckily for him though, he'd be able to score a pinfall over Mr. Kennedy when the time for his next pay-per-view bout came on February 17th. 
and he wouldn't be the only one picking up a big win that night either because elsewhere, Edge successfully defended against Rey Mysterio for the second month in a row, and both The Undertaker and Triple H would win their Elimination Chamber matches so as to earn themselves world title shots at WrestleMania. Of course, while it would be Edge that the Deadman was set to challenge at this event, the opponent for the game would still have to be decided, as Randy Orton and John Cena took to the ring later in the evening. But while the Viper ended up winning this one, the fact that he purposefully got himself disqualified meant that at the Showcase of the Immortals the following month, the whole thing would be turned into a triple threat match featuring the Champ, Cena, and the Cerebral Assassin. Before we get there though, the 2008 WWE Hall of Fame took place on March 29th and saw more high-level entrants in the form of Mae Young, High Chief Peter Maivia, Soul Man Rocky Johnson, and none other than the Nature Boy himself, Ric Flair. That said, the celebrations would be short-lived for the former NWA World's Champion, as the very next night he'd face the toughest challenge to his career yet when he went one-on-one -on -one with Shawn Michaels. Yes, it was a meeting decades in the making as two of the greatest of all time finally got to go at it at the biggest show of the year. And over the course of this one, emotions ran high, as fans gradually realized that, now a little longer in the tooth than he had been in his prime, Slick Rick was just no match for the Heartbreak Kid anymore. So when HBK finally put him down for good with a sweet chin music after delivering a final I'm sorry, I love you to him, it signaled the end of Flair's in-ring career in WWE. And as sad as this was, though, at least he got to go out with an excellent bout. A bout so good, in fact, it was able to stand out amongst a stacked card, which also included CM Punk winning the Money in the Bank ladder match to earn himself a title shot at the time of his choosing, Kane defeating Chavo Guerrero for the ECW title in just 11 seconds, Randy Orton retaining the WWE strap in a three-way contest with John Cena and Triple H, and Floyd Money Mayweather hitting the ring for a celebrity showdown against The Big Show. Then, in the main event, The Undertaker's streak of five-star WrestleMania classics would continue when he challenged Edge for the World Heavyweight title, with the dead man here picking up the win and the belt after just 24 minutes to take his record to 16-0. So with at least one new champion being crowned and one major career ending that night, it felt like a new dawn for WWE, as the following evening on Raw, Ric Flair got a final send-off which ranks among the best and most emotional the wrestling industry has ever seen. One person not happy with Shawn Michaels for ending the Nature Boy's career, however, was Batista, and that was why he would challenge him to a match at the next pay-per-view of the year, April 27th's Backlash. Before we get there, though, the King of the Ring would be revived on the April 18th episode of Raw, and there, after a grueling one-night tournament, William Regal ended up coming out on top, with his victory only serving to make him even more egomaniacal and power-mad in his role as general manager, as he can now add the best wrestler on the roster to his list of accolades. That said, he wouldn't bother hitting the ring for Backlash a couple of weeks later, as there, the card would be filled up with rematches from WrestleMania, which included The Undertaker once again retaining the World Heavyweight title against Edge, and Kane beating Chavo Guerrero for a second straight month. Of course, there were some changes though, because not only would Matt Hardy defeat MVP to win the United States title, but Triple H would beat Randy Orton, John Cena, and JBL in a fatal four-way match to crown himself new WWE Champion too. Even with this happening, however, the most noteworthy moment of the night would be saved for the Shawn Michaels-Batista match, as when HBK channeled his old self by faking a leg injury, then winning the match while his opponent's guard was down, special guest referee Chris Jericho took umbrage with the fact that fans continued to cheer for him, despite the blatant cheating. And that would spark one of the greatest feuds WWE had seen in years, because over the weeks which followed, Y2J continually tried to get Michaels to admit wrongdoing. When he wouldn't do this though, and when fans remained on his side in the matter regardless, Jericho would begin undergoing the most justified heel turn ever as he morphed into a more cold and calculated Anton Chigurh inspired character, one who always dressed sharply and spoke confidently, and who would challenge his rival to a match at May 18th's Judgment Day. That said, by the time this one was over and HBK was standing tall as the winner, it seemed like the hostilities between the two had been put to bed because they'd leave things there with a handshake. Elsewhere, meanwhile, things would not be so civil, because after William Regal had abused his power to stop a match between Triple H and Randy Orton on Raw, and then rebooked it inside of a steel cage at the pay-per-view, the two rivals destroyed each other, with the game ultimately coming out on top here. 
And he wasn't the only champion retaining his belt, as not only would The Miz and John Morrison retain the WWE Tag Team titles against CM Punk and Kane, but Mickie James would keep the women's division alive during its darkest days when she successfully defended her strap against Beth Phoenix and Molina. Then, after the World Heavyweight title had been vacated by Edge's on-screen girlfriend Vicky Guerrero on SmackDown a few weeks prior, The Undertaker would be forced to try and win it all over, something he was ultimately unable to do, as by the end of this one against the Canadian, the blue brand would still be without a champion. Of course, that would lead us into the next pay-per-view of the year on June 1st, One Night Stand, as there, at a show which was once supposed to be an ECW exclusive, the dead man lost to the rated R superstar in a tables, ladders, and chairs match, with this loss meaning that the heel was now the champ once more. And aside from that, Triple H would beat Randy Orton again in a last man standing bout, John Cena would get the better of JBL in a first blood contest, and Batista would finally get his win over Shawn Michaels when the two went one-on-one -on -one in a stretcher match. Following this, though, everything changed, as on June 23rd and 25th, the 2008 draft took place and saw big shockers when Rey Mysterio, CM Punk, and Batista were moved to Raw, and Jeff Hardy, Mr. Kennedy, and Kane each got shifted over to SmackDown. And this also meant that as the game was still the WWE Champion, the blue brand would get both world titles on its roster, heading into the next big show of the year, June 29th's Night of Champions. Still, at least there, John Cena would get one last chance to take the belt back home to Raw, as his match with the champ had already been booked prior to the draft taking place. Unfortunately for him, and for the red brand as a whole though, he would be unable to do this. And that wasn't the only failed challenge on this show, because elsewhere, Batista failed to defeat Edge for the World Heavyweight title, and Katie Lee Burchill would be unable to best Mickie James in the women's title match. Perhaps the most interesting historical moment of this whole night, however, came earlier when after abandoning his former partner Hardcore Holly and ultimately sending him packing from the company, Cody Rhodes would take the next step on the road to stardom when he aligned himself with Ted DiBiase Jr. That said, while they were at least able to adorn Raw with some tag team gold together going forward, it still left the brand without a world champion. So perhaps realizing this, CM Punk seized the opportunity when, after Edge chose to make a guest appearance on the June 30th episode of Raw, the Second City Saint would cash in his Money in the Bank contract to take home the title for the first time in his career. And that would lead us into July 20th's The Great American Bash, as there, Punk managed to come out of his World Heavyweight title match with Batista still holding onto the belt after the whole thing ended in a double disqualification. Outside of this, though, other matches on the card would have more definite endings as Triple H defeated Edge in the WWE title bout, and Chris Jericho took the fight to Shawn Michaels again when hostilities between them flared up once more. And this time, things wouldn't end in a handshake. No, Y2J would actually give him a kayfabe eye injury which necessitated the match being called as a technical knockout for the heel. Then, in a sign of the changing times, the Divas era would begin when Michelle McCool beat Natalya to become the inaugural Divas Champion. But that wasn't the only sign of the changing times, because after this show, WWE would formally move from a TV-14 product to a TV-PG-1, kicking off the PG era in the process. And that new era would get its first chance to shine at SummerSlam on August 17th, as there, CM Punk took center stage when he defended his World Heavyweight title against JBL. Luckily for him, though, the champ would be able to overcome this challenge, as would the WWE Champion too, because immediately following this, Triple H managed to get the better of his opponent for the night, the Great Khali. Elsewhere, meanwhile, The Undertaker sent Edge to hell when he chokeslammed him through the ring during their Hell in a Cell match, Santino Morella and Beth Phoenix became Intercontinental Champion and Women's Champion respectively in the same tag team contest, and the bout six years in the making took place when after being separated by brands for so long, John Cena and Batista finally clashed one-on-one. -on -one. Perhaps most notably though, this night would also see the continuation of the Shawn Michaels Chris Jericho storyline, because when HBK came out with his wife to announce that he was going to retire from the ring following an eye injury he'd picked up at the hands of his rival, Y2J interrupted the scene and successfully relit a fire under the babyface by punching Mrs. Michaels in the face. Of course, this would see the Heartbreak Kid go back on his retirement promise then, as the following month at September 7th's Unforgiven, he'd face off against Jericho in an unsanctioned match. 
And it's just as well that this one was unsanctioned, because it would get so bloody and brutal over the course of it that it would cause Vince McMahon to ban the use of blood on his TV going forward, with his reasoning for this being that it no longer fit the PG direction the company was moving in. Still, at least it ended with the babyface getting the win after the referee was forced to stop the bout. And it wasn't the only decisive win on this show as it happened, because elsewhere, Cody Rhodes and Ted DiBiase Jr. would defend their World Tag Team titles against Crime Time. And in the first two championship scramble matches, Mark Henry and Triple H would reign tall as the ECW and WWE champions respectively, even if the latter bout briefly saw Brian Kendrick hold the top prize. That said, for as shocking as this was, it was nothing compared to the third and final championship scramble match for the World Heavyweight title, because after CM Punk was kayfabe injured prior to the bout and forced to sit it out, Chris Jericho shocked everyone by taking his place and despite losing earlier on in the night, finishing things out as the new top dog on Raw. Yes, over the course of an hour, Y2J had gone from the pits of despair to the top of the world. Of course, this high wouldn't last for long because just a few weeks later, it was announced that at the next pay-per-view of the year on October 5th, No Mercy, the best feud WWE had seen in years would finally come to a conclusion when Shawn Michaels challenged the champion in a ladder match. Before we get there though, The Undercard saw The Big Show get a major win when he defeated The Undertaker by means of technical knockout, Batista earned the next title shot on Raw when he pinned JBL, and Mark Henry successfully defend the ECW world title then, in the first of two main events, Jeff Hardy's return to the top of the card would see him take on Triple H for the WWE title. But while he wasn't able to win this one, fans still had hopes they'd see a title change, as immediately following that, Shawn Michaels and Chris Jericho put things to bed once and for all, with the World Heavyweight title on the line. In a surprise twist here though, it would be the heel that ended up winning the program, as after 22 minutes and 20 seconds, Y2J was able to climb the ladder and retrieve his belt. Of course, even if he had now vanquished his main foe, he still had to defend that strap all over again at the next pay-per-view of the year, October 26th, Cyber Sunday. And like the same show in prior years, this one would see fans vote on different match stipulations and entrance, the biggest of which was the main event seeing Chris Jericho defend against Batista, with Stone Cold Steve Austin serving as the special guest referee. So with a babyface ref there to keep order then, the animal would be able to end Y2J's reign after less than a month. And that wouldn't be the only big moment of the show because elsewhere, Jeff Hardy re-entered the main event scene when he was chosen to challenge WWE Champion Triple H in an unsuccessful effort. On top of that, The Undertaker got revenge on the big show during a last man standing match, and in a fun nostalgic segment, the Honky Tonk Man would defeat Intercontinental Champion Santino Morella in just over a minute. As well as this, the female roster would compete in a costume contest won by Mickey James. Surprisingly though, John Cena would not play a part on the show. Of course, that wasn't because the WWE had given up on their Golden Goose or anything. No, rather they were just saving him for the following month, as it was announced on the 800th episode of Raw soon thereafter that he'd be challenging the World Heavyweight Champion and November 23rd Survivor Series. But who would the champion be then? Well, that was decided later on in the same show, as in a steel cage rematch from Cyber Sunday, Chris Jericho would manage to regain the top prize on Raw so as to walk into the winter as the undisputed top dog. And that would lead us directly into Survivor Series then, because while Big Match John was getting ready to challenge Y2J, elsewhere, the other big main event would see Triple H defend his WWE title against Edge and Vladimir Kozlov in a triple threat bout. Surprisingly though, in both cases, a new champion would be crowned here, as not only would Cena win the big one for the fourth time in his career, but the rated R superstar would start his own sixth reign on top of the mountain. Aside from that, however, the rest of the card wasn't nearly as noteworthy as it would be filled with largely forgettable 5-on-5 five -five elimination contests and an even worse casket match between The Undertaker and The Big Show. So it's just as well the last show of the year was much better, and the reason this one is so well remembered is because it saw a popular tag team star finally reach his full potential and rise all the way to the top of the card. Yes, despite his personal issues, by this point Jeff Hardy was so over with fans that he was actually outselling John Cena in merchandise sales. And given how much of a backlash there still was against Big Match John from a vocal section of the fan base, it only made sense WWE would decide to pull the trigger on someone who people seemed to unanimously love then. That was why in the main event of the final pay-per-view of the year, Armageddon, 
It would be Hardy going up against Edge and Triple H in a three-way bout for the WWE title. And on that night, after a match which lasted just over 17 minutes, the charismatic Enigma scored the winning pinfall to become world champion for the first time in his career, with it seeming for a brief moment like he might even usurp John Cena as the face of the company. Of course, if Cena had anything to say about this, that wouldn't be the case, as earlier on in the night, he'd been able to successfully defend the world heavyweight title against Chris Jericho. Elsewhere, meanwhile, the rebuilding of CM Punk would begin when he won a number one contendership match so as to get a future shot at Intercontinental Champion William Regal. But that wouldn't happen until the following year because, another brief stop over in Iraq for a tribute to the troop show aside, this would mark the end of 2008. And sure, it hadn't been a perfect year. That shouldn't suggest that there wasn't good here too, because with the Shawn Michaels-Chris Jericho feud still standing as an all-time great, and both Jeff Hardy and CM Punk finally getting the pushes they deserved, there was plenty of hope on the horizon that 2009 was going to be a lot better. 2009 was a huge year in pop culture. In the world of film, Avatar became the highest grossing movie of all time. In television, Modern Family first hit the air. Meanwhile, over in the world of wrestling, it was a year where, with the PG era now in full effect, both Randy Orton and John Cena would dominate the main event scene. But how did it all happen? Well, join us today as we take a deep dive into the entire story from start to finish in the WWE in 2009, A Year in Review. When we last left off, John Cena was standing tall on Raw as the World Heavyweight Champion, and Jeff Hardy had finally reached the top of the mountain over on SmackDown to become the WWE Champion. That said, neither man could celebrate for long, because at the first big pay-per-view event of the year on January 25th, the Royal Rumble, each would have to defend their titles in separate bouts. And for the franchise player on the red brand, this meant going up against not only JBL, but also the man who was now under the employ of the Texan, Shawn Michaels. Yes, in one of the most nonsensical storylines of the era, HBK apparently lost all of his money and so had to take a job working as a personal assistant for Bradshaw in order to make ends meet. Still though, even if he was in his boss's corner for his big title shot at the Rumble, it wouldn't be enough to cause the belt to change hands as come the end, Big Match John continued to stand tall. Not that the same could be said for Jeff Hardy, however, as when he went up against Edge immediately after, he'd end up losing the WWE Championship when his brother Matt interfered and screwed him over. Then, once that was over, the Royal Rumble itself took place, where 30 men fought for the right to go to the main event of WrestleMania. And at the end of this one, it came down to just two people, Randy Orton and Triple H. But while in most incidences, the game would be too much to overcome, here, Randy was in the middle of a career best run where he'd started laying out everyone with aggressive punts to the head. So there was no way he was going to lose then. That said, after he did win, his new violent attitude became a problem for WWE as they didn't want anyone getting kicked in the head and concussed during the main event of the biggest show of the year. And this problem only got worse when, on the January 29th episode of Raw, the Viper punted Vince McMahon himself. So seeing the screw job coming, Orton got a doctor to diagnose him with intermittent explosive disorder, a diagnosis which meant that he could not be fired or removed from the WrestleMania main event, otherwise it would be considered an act of discrimination. Yes, whether management liked it or not, the age of Orton was going to happen. The only question left was who would he be facing on the grandest stage of them all. And that was something we'd find out on February 15th's No Way Out as it happened. Why was this? Well, here, two Elimination Chamber matches would take place, one for the WWE title and one for the World Heavyweight title. And in the former, after outlasting Edge, Jeff Hardy, The Undertaker, The Big Show, and Vladimir Kozlov, it was Triple H himself who came out on top, with this setting up the showdown between him and his former Evolution teammate the next month. But what of the other Chamber match? Well, this one would also see a title change as, after going toe-to-toe -to -toe with John Cena, Rey Mysterio, Chris Jericho, Kane, and Mike Knox, it was Edge who once again regained the World Heavyweight title so as to head into Mania as the champion. Of course, those weren't the only noteworthy moments of this show, however, as elsewhere, Shawn Michaels finally managed to get out from under the thumb of JBL when he beat him in a singles bout, and Randy Orton's war with the McMahon family continued when he defeated Shane McMahon in a no-holds-barred match. But that wasn't the end of the Viper's assault on the royal family of wrestling, because the very next night on Raw, he'd lay out a returning Stephanie with an RKO too. 
So realizing something had to be done, Triple H broke the fourth wall the following week when he revealed that yes, he and the Billion Dollar Princess were still married in real life. And since Orton had made things so personal by attacking his wife, the game was going to make it his mission to end the heel once and for all at WrestleMania. But while that might have been the big feud going into the show, it wasn't the match people were talking about come the end of things, as at WrestleMania 25 on April 5th, arguably the greatest wrestling match of all time would take place. Before we get there though, the Hall of Fame happened the night prior, and saw more heavyweights being inducted in the form of Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, the Von Erich family, and Stone Cold Steve Austin. No doubt then, there was a whole lot of partying taking place after this event, and once the celebrations were complete and everyone had a chance to recover, the Bumper Mania card began the following day with CM Punk winning the Money in the Bank ladder match for the second year in a row when he defeated Kane, Mark Henry, MVP, Shelton Benjamin, Kofi Kingston, Christian, and Finley. After that early high though, things would take a downturn when the Women's Battle Royal was pretty much relegated to being a backdrop for a mini Kid Rock concert. But at least the show picked up again once this was over, because after weeks of taunting a number of WWE legends, Chris Jericho had to put his money where his mouth was when he stepped into the ring with Rowdy Roddy Piper, Jimmy Superfly Snuka, and Ricky the Dragon Steamboat in a 3-on-1 handicap match. And in what turned out to be the biggest shocker of the night, Steamboat proved he could still go after all those years. So well, in fact, that his performance damn near stole the show that night. That said, he, like his teammates, would fall to Y2J in the end, though the babyfaces did get some measure of revenge when, following the bout, Mickey Rourke, star of the Darren Aronofsky-directed movie The Wrestler, jumped into the ring and laid Jericho out with a single right hook. Then after this, the Hardy Boys came to blows in their brother vs. brother match, and once that was over, a major moment happened when JBL formally retired from the ring after losing the Intercontinental title to Rey Mysterio in just 22 seconds. As for the other big title matches, however, they'd last much longer, as it would take almost 15 minutes for John Cena to overcome both Edge and The Big Show and regain the World Heavyweight title, making it a Raw exclusive belt going forward. Then in the main event, Triple H and Randy Orton went for almost 25 minutes before the game was finally able to come out on top. But both of these matches were largely marred by having to follow what came before, as in the third from the top bout, the battle between heaven and hell took place when The Undertaker put his streak on the line against Shawn Michaels. Yes, this is the match which to this day many still consider to be the greatest ever, and watching it back now all those years later, it still stands the test of time. That said, for as close as HBK came to ending the streak here, with him at one point even almost winning by countout when The Undertaker nearly killed himself on a botched plancha to the outside, it was the dead man who stood tall in the end, taking his streak to 17-0 in the process. So after a match that good, the only question was, could anything in the immediate future follow it? Well, no, as it happened, because despite April 26th's backlash offering a decent card, there was nothing here which was going to wow fans in quite the same way as HBK vs. Taker. That's not to say there weren't some highlights though, as in his first single match in nine years, Ricky Steamboat proved he could still outdo most people on the roster when he had a pretty great bout with Chris Jericho. On top of that, Christian was able to defeat Jack Swagger to become the ECW World Champion, the Hardy Boys continued their feud with an I Quit match, and Randy Orton won the WWE title when, during a six-man tag featuring him, Cody Rhodes, and Ted DiBiase Jr. taking on Triple H, Batista, and Shane McMahon, he pinned the game to earn the belt as per a pre-match stipulation. But that wasn't the only world title changing hands here, as in the main event, Edge once again became the man when he defeated World Heavyweight Champion John Cena, all with a little help from the new Raw General Manager, Vicky Guerrero, of course. And as Edge was a SmackDown wrestler, this meant that going forward the World Heavyweight title would become a blue brand exclusive once more. That said, it also meant he would have to defend his belt against Jeff Hardy at the next big show of the year, May 17th's Judgment Day. Luckily then, the Rated R Superstar was on his best form that night, because after a battle which waged on for almost 20 minutes, he'd have come out of this one with the belt still around his waist after an interfering Matt Hardy gave him a surprise assist. Elsewhere, meanwhile, Randy Orton only just barely retained his WWE title when, during a bout with Batista, he got himself disqualified by slapping the referee in the face. Outside of those two matches, however, there wouldn't really be much of note which happened here, a sign that the overall creative direction of the show was beginning to stagnate. 
And the following month wouldn't be much better, unfortunately, as there, at June 7th's Extreme Rules, most of the card was made up of good, but by now overly familiar bouts, such as John Cena vs. The Big Show in a submission match, and Chris Jericho taking on Rey Mysterio for the Intercontinental title. Not that nothing noteworthy happened here, of course. No, in both world title matches, in fact, the belt would change hands when Batista defeated Randy Orton for the WWE title inside of a steel cage and Jeff Hardy bested Edge for the world heavyweight title in a ladder match. That said, Hardy's celebration proved to be short-lived as mere seconds after his victory, CM Punk came down to the ring to cash in his Money in the Bank contract and from there started his second reign on top. And as if that wasn't enough chaos, the very next night on Raw, Batista would be forced to vacate the WWE title after an injury attributed in storyline to Cody Rhodes and Ted DiBiase Jr. left him on the shelf for the foreseeable future. So with there now being no champion on Raw, a fatal four-way match was held later that night to determine who the new one would be, with this bout ultimately being won by Randy Orton. Yes, the Viper's Day in the Sun wasn't quite done yet, and he'd prove this later that month at June 28th's The Bash, when he successfully defended against his arch-rival Triple H in a Three Stages of Hell match. But while that might have been the highlight of the night, it wasn't the only noteworthy moment, as elsewhere, The Miz got a main event push when he went one-on-one -on -one with John Cena. Rey Mysterio defeated Chris Jericho for the Intercontinental title in a title versus mask match, and Jeff Hardy scored a win over CM Punk in the World Heavyweight title bout, though only via disqualification. So with the belt still being around the Second City Saints waist then, he was free to keep preaching to audiences about how much better he was than them on account of his straight-edge lifestyle, and he was also free to continue berating Hardy over his history of drug and alcohol addiction. Thankfully for the charismatic Enigma, though, he'd get one more chance to shut up his rival for good, as at the next big pay-per-view of the year on July 26th, Night of Champions, he'd go one-on-one -on -one with Punk again. Before that bout took place, though, the undercard saw Jericho, the new unified tag team champions, successfully defend against Cody Rhodes and Ted DiBiase Jr. And once that was over, Michelle McCool also defended the women's title against Melina, all while Mickey James was winning the Divas title from Maurice. Then, in the WWE title match, the Age of Orton continued when the Viper was able to overcome both Triple H and John Cena, with this all leading up to the World Heavyweight title bout immediately following, where Jeff Hardy finally put CM Punk in his place when he beat him to win the gold. And that would lead us directly into August 23rd's SummerSlam then, as there, Punk and Hardy went one-on-one -on -one for the World Heavyweight title a final time, with things this time being decided in a tables, ladders, and chairs match. But while the voice of the voiceless would come out of this one the victor, at least over on the Raw side of things, Randy Orton was able to retain his gold when he got the better of John Cena. Elsewhere, meanwhile, a fairly lackluster undercard saw Kane and the Great Khali bring things to a screeching halt for 10 full minutes with their singles bout, and D-Generation X come together again to defeat Cody Rhodes and Ted DiBiase Jr. in a tag team showing. So heading into September 13th's breaking point then, you'd be forgiven for thinking not much was going to change. But that's where you'd be wrong, because during the build to this on the August 28th episode of SmackDown, Jeff Hardy was written off TV when he lost a Loser Leaves Town match to CM Punk, with the reason for this being the charismatic Enigma had a number of injuries he had to heal up from. Ultimately, though, this sabbatical would end up being permanent, as with his substance issues continuing to be a problem, WWE chose not to renew his contract when it came up a few months later. So instead of resuming his feud with him then, CM Punk had to settle for taking on The Undertaker in a submission match at the pay-per-view. And against all odds here, he'd actually end up winning this one after Vicky Guerrero demanded the bell be rung while the dead man was locked in the Anaconda Vice, screwing him out of the title in front of the Montreal crowd. But it wasn't as if the fans didn't get anything to cheer for on this night, as prior to that, John Cena had beaten Randy Orton for the WWE title in an I Quit match. Elsewhere, meanwhile, things weren't as rosy for the babyfaces, as Kane and the Great Khali once again stunk out the joint in a Singapore Kane match, and D-Generation X underwent a shock loss when they were defeated by Cody Rhodes and Ted DiBiase Jr. in a submissions count anywhere bout. Yes, the slow rise of the legacy from being lower card acts to main event players was picking up speed now, and their victory here would be enough to see them legitimately go on last during the next big show of the year then, October 4th's Hell in a Cell. But not only would their rubber match with DX be the main event at this event, it would also take place inside the confines of the titular cage. 
And that wouldn't be the only Cell match that night as it happened, because prior to the closing bout, CM Punk defended his World Heavyweight title against The Undertaker inside the same structure. Unfortunately for him though, this would mark the end of his second run with the top prize on SmackDown, with the rumored reason for this being that Chick Magnet Phil allegedly upset someone behind the scenes by not coming to the arena for a show wearing a suit one night. Yes, backstage politics and wrestling can be a strange world to navigate, but at least Randy Orton didn't have to worry about this, as he'd defeat John Cena once again to become WWE Champion. Then after Mickey James bested Alicia Fox so as to retain the Divas title, and Jericho successfully defended their unified tag belts against Rey Mysterio and a returning Batista, DX and the Legacy finally put their beef to bed during the third Hell in a Cell bout of the night, about where, in the end, it was the Legends who came out on top. So with things finally settled then, everyone was free to move on to the next big show of the year on October 25th, Bragging Rights, as it was there that HBK, Triple H, and Cody Rhodes were all forced to team up as part of a SmackDown vs. Raw 14-man tag. Of course, they were helped along in this battle by also having The Big Show, Jack Swagger, Kofi Kingston, and Mark Henry on their side. Meanwhile, however, standing across from them on the other end of the ring would be the eventual winning team, SmackDown's own Chris Jericho, Kane, Matt Hardy, R-Truth, Finley, Tyson Kidd, and David Hart Smith. But this show wasn't all about multi-man action because elsewhere, former partners The Miz and John Morrison had an interpromotional showdown. Then, once that was over, The Undertaker fended off the challenge of not only CM Punk, but Batista and Rey Mysterio too, as he defended his World Heavyweight title in a fatal four-way match. And that wasn't all either, because in the main event of the night, John Cena and Randy Orton went at it in a 60-minute Iron Man bout for the WWE title, with this one ending in dramatic fashion after Big Match John tapped out the Viper to leave the final score at 6-5 in his favor. Yes, it was an exciting end to this chapter of their legendary feud, and one which left whoever was going on last next month with big shoes to fill. So, luckily then, when the time came for Survivor Series on November 22nd, the people involved would be more than capable of doing this, as it would be Cena defending against both Triple H and Shawn Michaels. That said, this was far from the handicap bout many expected it would turn into after it was announced, because, with both DX members wanting to be the man, neither was afraid to go after the other, as evidenced during the opening moments when HBK super kicked his partner out of the ring. In the end though, Big Match John managed to come out on top anyway, as would The Undertaker during his own triple threat World Heavyweight title defense against Chris Jericho and The Big Show. As for the rest of the card, well after coming to blows following their loss to Jericho the month prior, Batista and Rey Mysterio had a physical battle which ended in a technical knockout win for The Animal. And following that, three 5-on-5 five -five elimination matches would take place, the first of which saw Team Miz defeat Team Morrison, the second of which saw Team Kingston get the better of Team Orton, and the third of which saw Team Mickey James pick up the victory over Team Michelle McCool. But wait, why was Kofi Kingston suddenly in a prominent spot here? Well, around this time he'd begun a brief flirtation with the main event scene when he got involved in a feud with Randy Orton. And this push would only intensify for the Ghanaian-born star when, just a couple of weeks later, on an episode of Raw airing live from Madison Square Garden, he'd deliver a boom drop through a table to the Viper in what was probably the highlight of his career at that time. As for the rest of the roster though, they'd only get one more big chance to prove themselves before the year was out, because following another trip to Iraq for a tribute to the Troops show on December 4th, December 13th would see the company return to San Antonio to put on their last pay-per-view of 2009, tables, ladders, and chairs. And here, while the undercard saw Christian defend the ECW world title in a ladder match against Shelton Benjamin, Drew McIntyre win the Intercontinental title from John Morrison, and Randy Orton get a measure of revenge over Kofi Kingston by pinning him in the middle of the ring, the main events would all be about the three top titles in WWE. Yes, the WWE title, World Heavyweight title, and Unified Tag titles were all put on the line in a series of themed gimmick matches, the first of which saw newcomer Sheamus shock the world when he won the top prize on Raw from John Cena in a tables bout. So after that then, you'd be forgiven for not knowing what to expect. Luckily though, in the case of The Undertaker, he'd have a much better night as an incoming champion when he successfully defended his title in a chairs match against Batista. Then, in the main event, the reign of Jericho finally came to an end, as after a tables, ladders, and chairs contest which went for over 22 minutes, it would be their opponents for the night, D-Generation X, who came out on top to stand tall as the undisputed tag team champions. 
And that's where we'll call it a day for today too then, because with this, WWE's year had finally come to an end. As for 2010, well, that's another story, but don't worry, we'll get there soon enough. And if you want a hint of what's to come, just remember that it was a year that not only saw a brand new stable crash and burn, but the year that a legend hung up his boots.